20 at 7 p.m. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by the Anchor Bay Junior ROTC. Please call the roll. Supervisor Accumetti. Here. Treasurer Lafada. Here. Trustee Anderson. Here. Trustee Joseph. Here. Trustee Bosberg. Here. Trustee Demink. Is it absent? I, I would ask for an excuse for Trustee Demink. Clerk Barry is here. I'd like to make a motion to excuse Trustee Demink. Support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed by saying nay. Please refrain from calling trustees Demink's name during roll call. I'm battling a little bit of a illness tonight, so I'm going to do things a little different and have Clerk Berry read the actual agenda items as they come up. For, item number four is presentations. Item 4A, presentation by the DIA, Detroit Institute of Arts, to inform residents about the services the museum provides. Good evening. Uh, I, too, am battling a little bit of something, so I probably will make my presentation short and let Ian, your expert, take over the presentation for us. My name is Pam Wavers. I am the Director of Public and Community Affairs for the DIA. And this is Ian. Ian, if you want to introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Ian Epnicki. I'm the Community Engagement Manager for Macomb County at the museum. Thanks for coming out tonight. Good crowd, you must have heard I was coming. Uh, you're in luck, because we're gonna share some good stuff with you. And it's good uh, to be here. It's good to be amongst uh, many friends and colleagues and, uh, and past employees that I've worked with. So uh, Ian, take it away. All right, so as was stated, the reason we're here is to talk about the services that the museum provides to residents in the comb. After the presentation, be happy to take questions, but I want to start off by highlighting our collection. So I included a few images on the slide here um, from our huge collection. We have over 65,000 works of art in the collection spanning from antiquity to current times all over the globe. Um, so here's just a few in the top left. There's a painting called The Wedding Dance by Peter Bruegel the Elder. He was a Netherlandish painter. This was made in 1566. It's a subject of an exhibition that's open right now and free at the museum. And it's one of only two works by this painter in the country, so it's a really uh, rare and special masterpiece that we have. In the top center, it's this tiny image, but it's a really huge work. It's an image of Diego Rivera's Detroit industry murals that are in the center of the museum. Uh, this is just one wall, but it's an entire room filled with images of working class, working class people in the metro Detroit area. And it's really great to see people walk into this room because uh, there's a sense of empowerment when you see pe working class people on the wall. A lot of people in the region know somebody or they themselves work in the auto industry or a supply chain industry. So it's just a, a common person, you know, my grandpa, my parents, they all worked in the auto factory. So it's, it's just nice to see a personal connection people make with art. But top right corner, Vincent Van Gogh, he's the subject of an upcoming show. There's going to be over 60 works by Van Gogh in the museum this summer at the same time. 
this is a self-portrait that we acquired in the 1920s. The DIA was the first museum in North America to acquire a Van Gogh. So we probably got a decent deal. And we have one of between 30 and 40 self-portraits that he made in his career. So it's a pretty small number. Um, and one's right down the street in Detroit. The bottom left corner, you all know Kermit. But you might not have known that the DIA has a really great puppet collection. And this is actually a prototype that Jim Henson made in 1969 when he was developing the character. And we have the authentic one there. And he's out on display right now. He's really fragile, really delicate. And he'll only be on display till the end of March. So come see him while you can if you want to visit a local celebrity. Uh, in the bottom center, is something on the older end of the spectrum. It's over 2,500 years old. It's an image of Mushushu, and Mushushu would have stood guard over the ancient city of Babylon. This was part of a big blue glazed tile gate called the Ishtar Gate. Uh, but next to that old object, there's a, a fairly new object. This is a painting by Kahinde Wiley. And it's showing an ordinary contemporary figure in ordinary contemporary clothes but he's inserted into this historic painting. It's referencing a French painting of one of Napoleon's soldiers. And so it really gets people talking about uh, how art can convey symbols of power and status. And it really starts great conversations again. And I got to take part in a lot of those conversations because I worked in education at the museum for several years. But, and I could keep going. This is the, this is the fun part for me. But the, the thing that really brings our collection to life and help bring it to people is the millage that was passed in 2012. And so I just wanted to talk about the agreements that we have to service that. So in 2012, uh, Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne counties approved a millage to support the DIA. And then following that, the counties established governing bodies to establish different service fulfillments that we'd have to uh, abide by. And then we have an independent accounting firm that audits that every year, makes, makes sure we're doing what we say we do, and it's made available to the public. Um, but the four pillars of those agreements in all the counties are what you see on the board. There's free general admission. There's free field trips, including transportation. Senior programming, also we do transportation for that for free. And community partnerships. So I'll go through these. I'll try to be quick. Not as long-winded as I am with the art stuff, but... Um, one, free general admission. So every day of the year that we're open to the public, you get free general admission to the museum, unlimited. Um, we're open six days a week. We're open late on Fridays. Um, take advantage of it as much as you want. Since 2012, we've welcomed over 2 million Tri-County residents. We also do great stuff with students. And for the last five years up to recently, I was a gallery teacher. So I actually led students through the museum. Um, and we, we do something like uh, that really enables a lot of schools to take advantage. We offer free field trip buses. A lot of school districts wouldn't be able to afford to visit if it weren't for those free buses. So after we were able to provide that, the attendance just went through the roof. From prior to 2012, we were seeing something like 30,000 students a year. Now, just last year, we saw 80,000. So it's really invited a lot more people through the doors because of that free busing. But we also get to do cool stuff where I, I had the opportunity to uh, tour around Trustee Vosberg uh, before I was in this position when I was a gallery teacher and got to talk about our, our collection of Native American art and we shared a conversation about local Native American history. And then so as soon as I got into the community engagement department, I, I wanted to visit Chesterfield and actually see it firsthand and I was given some information about the local history and I was able to give that to our education staff. We have a new curator of Native American art and the education team is going to be collaborating and, and taking that information, seeing how we can incorporate local history into tours because uh, we really want to support uh, teachers in their classrooms and the things that are important locally. And just in 2018, uh, about 70,000 Macomb, uh, we had about 70,000 Macomb County admissions to the museum. Uh, we had about 17,000 Macomb County students in the museum last year from 155 schools. <laughs> but we do work with teachers as well. We offer professional development experiences. So one thing we do is we'll invite teachers to get first looks of upcoming exhibitions and sneak peeks of uh, 
opening galleries that we might be changing or, or um, renovating. We also do workshops and, and coach on visual thinking strategies, which is a foundational element of the teaching practices at the museum. And visual thinking strategies is an inquiry-based conversation about art that encourages uh, students and, and even teachers to share differing ideas and have a conversation. And it, it's proven to increase critical thinking skills and listening skills. And those are skills that are useful to other classrooms, not just art class and not just in an art museum, but skills that people can use, critical thinking skills. We also do uh, a lot of senior programming. We do something called Thursdays at the Museum every Thursday, which is free programming for visitors who are 55 and older. Uh, every Thursday there's a different program, but every Thursday there's, a, there's always a cookie and coffee reception at 2.30. Um, and that's open to the public. We do get a lot of groups that come through for different things like art making in the studio. We do tours of the collection. We'll do films once a month. Uh, there's also special lectures or musical performances. So it's always something different, but it's always anchored by that kind of social time with the coffee and cookies at the end of the day. And if there's a group of 25 or more, we can provide a free bus. But we do open it up to anybody. So individuals can come, and couples can come, or small groups can come. We encourage people to drop in on their own. And we've been seeing a lot more turnout of individuals coming, which is great, because the, the foundation is groups from, coming from senior centers or libraries um, coming on, a, on one of those free buses. But we're seeing a lot more people just popping in, and that's really what we want to see. Oh, another thing I should mention, sorry, um, is behind the scenes. And that's a, a program where we we'll actually go out into the community. So not everybody can or is interested in coming to the museum. So for free, we'll send a trained volunteer out with a projector and with a lot of knowledge. And they can speak on about 16 different subjects. And they can do that at a senior facility. They can do that at a library or any other meeting room. And we'll come to you. And that's free. And there's, like, like I said, about 16 menu items, different topics. You could cycle through 16, one a month if you wanted to. Um, and I, if anybody's interested, I could tell you how to set that up. It's all on our website. But the fourth pillar is our community partnerships. And there's a few things that we do that fall under that. Um, the, the, geez. Go back there. Uh, the PIPA projects we, we work on, what you're seeing here on the right is our Partnerships in Public Art program, uh, which is where the art studio at the museum works with community partners, <laughs> surveys community members to find out what types of art they might want in their community, and find out what types of symbols and imagery they feel would represent their community. And the museum uses its resources to make that happen. So murals like this, this giant mural in Romeo here, uh, very expensive from material cost to the cost of talent. And the DIA has the resources to coordinate that talent and, and, and bring it all together and make something beautiful like that. And we do several of those a year. But we also do something called Inside Out. You might have seen Inside Out over the years. It's been going on for a decade now. Here's a few images of Inside Out. It's where we bring high quality framed reproductions of our masterpieces into unexpected outdoor spaces throughout Metro Detroit. Uh, here you see uh, Pam's mother-in-law standing next to a Van Gogh painting, so that's, that's great. But we're gonna be in Macomb County this summer. I'm getting started personally on selecting images to place throughout uh, several different areas. Uh, that you can check out. We're also in the Secretary of State offices, several branches throughout the Tri-County, so that's something different we're doing with Inside Out. We're actually bringing it inside. Uh, so when you're waiting for your license renewal, you can maybe enjoy a work of art on the walls. Um, dramatically changes the atmosphere. But, you know, I could continue to ramble, but if you want me to, just say so, I will. But how about, I just wrap it up there because I just wanted to, to share what we've been doing and what we're going to continue to do and just remind you that it's really since 2012 the support of the, the millage that enables us to do this sort of stuff that we weren't able to do prior and we've grown in so many ways at the museum in ways we couldn't have foreseen because of that support. It really turned us from this insular place. A lot of times museums can be really inward looking and stodgy. 
but because of these service agreements, it's kind of forced us to look outward and spread our reach a little further. So thank you for supporting it. Uh, but are there any questions? Trusting Joseph. Thank you, Father. Yeah, how does the questioning work? <laughs> Okay. Uh, just for, everything through the chair and just for the okay. board during presentations. Great. The uh, thing that I wanted to say thank you to the, uh, the leaders is the invitation that is extended uh, every few months to uh, local officials throughout the Tri County area. Um, the uh, county leaders got this uh, invitation, um, and it really is very well attended. I have the opportunity to go down and meet the county officials from uh, all over. Uh, talk about some of the things uh, program uh, that are being offered to our residents and then be able to come back and talk to people about uh, opportunities to address or to, to utilize the DIA. What's nice is there's a lot of familiar faces down there, uh, Ms. Labors who work extensively in this county, uh, with the executive's office, uh, Ms. Mossberg, your, your counterpart on the board, Mr. Flynn, is very active uh, in um, making sure that Macomb County is very well represented and reached out to on a regular basis. And so uh, it was really through that, and I heard back uh, after sharing my experience with some residents about individuals who just uh, go down and um, sometimes they just hang out in the, uh, I think it's the Kresge Court, yeah. where you can just sort of uh, just just relax. And there's books, and it's a very, it's, just a, it's, a, it's an exceptional space. And uh, it's free. Uh, well, not free. I mean, uh, we, we do we do contribute in the way of a millage, but um, it's it's a great opportunity for people who otherwise wouldn't have been able to to utilize that. So it's uh, really good. And I appreciate you coming out to Chesterfield to tell us more about it. I appreciate those kind words, and hopefully I'll see at least a few of you at County Leaders Night. I'll be there. Any other questions? Trustee Vosberg. Thank you. And thank you, Ian and Pam, for being here. Uh, I talked to uh, some of the seniors here that have attended the, the Thursday's events. They love it. And when they, one particular program didn't, just didn't interest me at all. And I thought, well, we'll see. So then I asked, and they loved it. So, but that's the beauty of art. It, there's so many things there that whatever you, uh, you may not like one part of it, but there's plenty of other things to find that you do. And then the, the other is um, the power of networking. As was previously stated, uh, one of my fellow commissioners is, is or was at the time Ian's boss, and um, the, he called his kind. The come his boss called me and said, "Why don't you come down here? I want to show you around and see what's going on." And that's when we uh, went to we did a bunch of things, but one of them was the Native American collection. And as Ian said, um, that made uh, a con another collect connection here to Chesterfield because I said, "You know, we're rich in history." you know, along the shoreline here. And then Adam, an employee from the Chesterfield Library, has, has, who loves local history, has compiled a bibliography of resources for early Native American history in this area. So we were able to put all that information together. So it, I, I was so thrilled when all of that came together because otherwise it was just things sitting downtown, things sitting in the library here, and we were able to put it all together. So. One of those opportunities. Thank no, you thank again. you again, because I, I, I know the gallery teachers were really thrilled to have that, that whole packet of information, and they'll make use of it. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, and me, and, yeah. and the entire DIA team for the value you bring to the region. And for thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I am 4B. Item 4. Thank you. Item 4B is a presentation by a township clerk and elections coordinator on the 2020 election cycle and precinct changes. Elections coordinator, currently has. Hello. I don't have another mic, so I'm going to stay here. And I'm going to be making the presentation from the dais today so that coordinator Gomez can use the podium and I can have the microphone here. We don't have a mobile one for you. Okay, 2020 precinct changes. Um, I had advised the board that we would be making this presentation um, in the coming um, weeks, several weeks ago, uh, to 
make the public as well as the board aware of the changes that are going to be affecting the upcoming election cycle, beginning with the March 10th, 2020 presidential primary. The 2020 presidential primary is being held on March the 10th. It is a closed primary. What does that mean? There are two types of primaries. There's an open primary and a closed primary. Closed primaries are primaries in which only members or individuals who are identifying as members of those parties can vote. They must select a particular ballot. In this case, it is either a Republican ballot, a Democratic ballot, or you may also select a ballot without a presidential primary. So um, there will be no presidential uh, candidates listed. It will simply be the one proposal that is on that ballot. Um, you must declare which ballot you would like. Now, that does not mean that you identify as that party. That simply means that that is the ballot that you would like to vote in that particular primary. On August the 4th, we will have our state primary. That is an open primary. And what that means is that all of the candidates will appear on the same ballot. There will not be separate ballots like there are in March. There will be one ballot. All uh, candidates, as well as proposals, will appear on that ballot. And um, you can choose at that time which uh, candidates to vote for. However, you cannot cross over. Essentially, what is happening in the August 4th primary is you have the Republicans and the Democrats both having primaries, but they share the same ballot. So if you are to select some Republican candidates and some Democratic candidates, you will spoil your ballot and nothing will count. Nothing in the partisan section will count. So please be advised that if you uh, vote in August, you must select candidates from either the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. You cannot select both. Now in March, you're prevented from doing that because they're two separate ballots. However, in August, because everyone appears on the same ballot, um, you need to be mindful of that. In November, November 3rd, 2020, is our general election. And that ballot is, just as you are familiar with, um, those that, that is not a primary ballot, that is a general election ballot. And it is during that election that you will be uh, given the option uh, to vote for whichever uh, candidates you would like. Simply do not vote for more than one candidate or more than number of candidates allowed in that race, and you'll be fine. So you can select from Republicans and Democrats in November, but that is the only time, the only election, this election cycle, that you can do that. There were quite a few election law changes that were affected by the proposals in 2018 that were voted on and approved by voters in November. One of those things was same-day voter registration. And what that means is that if you are not registered to vote, you may vote, uh, register to vote up to and on the day of election at the local clerk's office. You may vote absentee at the clerk's office or you may go to the polls. What's important to note is if you are registering to vote on election day, you must do that in the clerk's office. And if you would like to vote an absentee ballot on election day, you must do that at the clerk's office. You cannot do that at your precinct location. However, you may register to vote at the clerk's office and then drive to the polls at your polling location and vote. That is an option. But if you'd like to vote absentee, you must do it at the clerk's office. And to register, you must do that here at the clerk's office. One of the other proposals that passed was no reason absentee voting. Prior to November 2018, uh, you had to give a reason why you were voting absentee. Only certain individuals were allowed to vote absentee. Those that were absent from the community on the day of the election, those that were over a certain age, and several other criteria that was set by the state. However, this proposal changed that. You can now request an absentee ballot and give no reason for it. In other words, there are no longer any criteria or reasons for voting absentee or requesting an absentee ballot. You do not have to qualify for one. All registered voters may vote absentee. So do you need to register to vote or do you know someone who does? We please ask that you not wait until Election Day, although the law does provide for that. We ask that you not wait until that day to vote, it, or excuse me, to register. It is best uh, to come in and get that taken care of here at the clerk's office as soon as possible. You also have more options if you are choosing to register prior to Election Day. You can register by mail. You can also register online. 
You can register through the Secretary of State's office and various other uh, government offices. So in order to give yourself the most options for registering or someone else the most options for registering, it's best not to wait until election day, but you do now have that option. So how do you request an absentee ballot now that there is no longer a re uh, any type of uh, requirement to satisfy for that? Well, in order to receive an absentee ballot, you must fill out an application for the upcoming election. We will not issue an absentee ballot to you. Even if you have voted absentee in the past, we will not issue you a ballot unless we receive an application from you. So we must receive an application for the election in which you would like the ballot. Once we re uh, accept that and you return that completed application to the clerk's office, we will then issue the ballot as soon as ballots are made available. There is a requirement as well for clerks to, uh, re to turn around those absentee ballot applications within a certain period of time. Here in the clerk's office in Chesterfield, we have a goal to, return, uh, to turn around those absentee ballot applications and send the ballot out within 24 hours. If you would like to be placed on our absentee, our permanent absentee voter list, you may do that as well. What is the permanent absentee voter list? The permanent absentee voter list is a list that is maintained here in the clerk's office. And what it allows for is that if you are on that list, the clerk's office will automatically send you an application for an absentee ballot every election cycle. So you don't have to come and get an application or access one online or whatever the case might be. You will automatically receive that application. However, again, you must return that completed application to the clerk's office in order to be issued a ballot. If you would like to be on that list, it's very simple. You can send us an email, you can give us a call, you can come into the clerk's office. Just communicate in some way to the clerk's office and anyone in our office can help you. Um, just communicate to us that you'd like to be placed on the permanent absentee voter list. <coughs> we are always looking for election workers for upcoming elections and this uh, year is no exception. In fact, arguably, we will need more election workers this year than we have ever needed in the past because we anticipate a record number of absentee voters as well as a record number of voters at the polls. So uh, please contact the clerk's office if you are interested in working the election. We do provide paid training, and you are paid for the day. Our chair people are paid $250, co-chairs are paid $200, and inspectors are paid $160 for the full day. And if you can only work a partial day, you will receive $80 for a half day. So in order to be an election worker, uh, you do need to fill out an application, again available through the clerk's office, also available online, return it to us, and then we will notify you if you have been assigned to a position. The only requirements in order to be an election worker is to be a registered uh, voter in the state of Michigan, and you must select a party. So you must identify because there are requirements that we must satisfy from the state of Michigan um, as far as allocation of election workers and making sure that we have party balance in all of our precinct locations. Although computer experience is not required, uh, it is appreciated and it will be helpful. Okay, some very um, big changes for us here in Chesterfield this year. Um, due to a number of factors that we're going to go over in a minute, um, we needed to increase our number of precincts. Um, and we were also able at that time to make some uh, corrections to some uh, situations that we had here that had just developed over time. This is our current precinct map. Well, it was the former, excuse me, the former precinct map, the one that was in effect in 2018. We had 14 precincts and we had six split school precincts. What does that mean? That means that six of those 14 precincts had both Anchor Bay and Lance Cruz, or Lance Cruz and New Haven, um, they had two school districts. And that's often problematic when you have school board elections because you need to make sure that the voters who are coming in are get, receiving the correct ballot. So um, clerks often try to eliminate as much of uh, that situation as they can. So why do we need to make changes? There are a number of reasons. Um, to begin with, it is best practice that clerks will review approximately every four to five years um, their precinct alignment. 
And um, if you're growing faster, then you need to review it as needed. In our case, uh, we had some potential facility changes. Some of our precinct locations may have not been available for this election cycle or in the near future, and we wanted to address that. We wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to eliminate uh, some of our split school district precincts so that we could coordinate better for a distribution of ballots. And we also had multiple precincts that were nearing the maximum voter limit. Uh, there is a 2,999 voter maximum limit set by the state of Michigan, and we were coming very close to that due to the increased number of um, registered voters here in the township. Again, a growing community, increased population. We also knew that we had a record number of uh, building permits issued recently, and that we also know that then for the future, um, increased residents means increased registered voters, and we wanted to be able to accommodate that in the near future. So to give you an idea of the number of registered voters and how that's changed over time, in 2008, we had 28,780 registered voters. By 2024, we anticipate having 37,266 registered voters. That is a 30% increase from 2008. And the reason, uh, the way that we came up with that number uh, had to do with, again, number of building permits that are issued, residential dwellings that we anticipate, trending, um, and a number of other factors that go into um, the matrix that came up with that number. Uh, but it's a considerable increase and we needed to accommodate that. So this is a draft of the new precinct map. Our uh, planning um, uh, consultants are working on the actual pretty map that you see um, and the finalized map. But this was essentially our working draft uh, that we presented to them. We are increasing from 14 to 19 precincts five additional precincts. We will now take our six split school precincts down to only one. And all updated ID cards were mailed last week, alerting residents to changes and registered voters to changes. Also, prior to the uh, holidays, we did uh, mail out a considerable number of letters to all of those registered voters who were affected by the changes and invited them to an informational meeting that was held here at the township to answer any questions, and we were able to do that. We did a similar presentation and answered all of the questions that anyone had regarding how those changes affected them. So these are the two maps side by side, and you can see in the different shaded areas um, the 14 precincts versus the 19 precincts and how the different uh, distribution of registered voters changed the precinct boundaries. So we're just going to talk a little bit about each precinct and how, and how they were affected. So you may see that the precinct that you live in um, is highlighted. If you have any questions about that, um, we would be happy to answer those for you after the meeting, or you may contact us. Um, but this will give you an idea, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory. We will also place this on our website as well for your review. So in Precinct 1, they, uh, Precinct 1 experienced a boundary line change, so the boundaries of that precinct changed. There's also a new voting location for some individuals uh, in Precinct 1. Sugarbush Elementary is the uh, new voting location, and that was previously Green Elementary. So if you live in Precinct 1, be aware that there are those changes that affect you. Precinct 2, there was no change. They could still will continue to vote at Anchor Bay Middle School South. Precinct 3, and Precinct 3 is an interesting precinct because it has been problematic for uh, a number of years. Ever since I was uh, first clerk here in 2012, uh, Precinct 3 was a problem. That's in the southern part of the township. It was a very large precinct. It had a location that was difficult um, in that there was never adequate parking there. Um, the facility itself um, was challenging because it was our youth center. And uh, we'd always look for an opportunity to make improvements to Precinct 3, so I was very happy we were able to do that this time. Precinct 3 uh, experiences a boundary line change. We essentially uh, cut it in half and added a little bit along the water there. The voting location will change for most people in this precinct. You used to vote at the Youth Center, but now you'll be voting at Green Elementary. 
Precinct 4 in the northwest part of the township also experienced a boundary line change. However, they will vote in the same voting location and that is Carcanord Elementary. Precinct 5, no changes and same voting location at Lottie Schmidt Elementary. Precinct 6 also experienced a boundary line change. However, they will have the same voting location and that will be at our DPW building. Precinct 7, again north of 23 Mile Road between 23 and 24 off of SAS, experienced a boundary line change as well. It was essentially cut in half as well, but they will have the same voting location and that is Great Oaks Elementary. <coughs> Precinct 8, Precinct 8 ex also experienced a boundary line change. However, they will ha have the same voting location at Green Elementary. Precinct 9 did change considerably. Um, there was some additional um, uh, residential added to Precinct 9. There was a boundary line change and then very important for Precinct 9, there is a brand new voting location for Chesterfield residents, for the registered voters, that is at Faith Christian Center. We thank Faith Christian Center very much for agreeing to cooperate with us in housing some of our precinct locations. So if you live in Precinct 9, I think Trustee Joseph lives in Precinct 9. Um, 18. Uh, is it 18 now? It used to be Precinct 9, the old Precinct 9. Um, but Precinct 9 now votes at, the new Precinct 9 will vote at Faith Christian Center. Precinct 10, right along the water, experienced no changes in the same voting location and at Anchor Bay Middle School South. Precinct 11 experienced a boundary line change. Again, it was reduced almost by half, but has the same voting location, and that is at here at the Township Hall. Precinct 12, no changes, same voting location, Higgins Elementary. Precinct 13, the adjacent precinct, did experience a boundary line change. However, they will continue to vote at Higgins Elementary. Precinct 14 changed a considerable amount. Um, uh, we, uh, you can see how it's a bit oddly shaped and more so than before. And uh, this is a good opportunity to point out a lot of people when they see precinct changes or boundary line changes for political purposes, um, they'll say, oh gee, that's really gerrymandered. A lot of people like to talk about gerrymandering. And the fact of the matter is, is that when you're drawing lines for precincts, congressional districts, any type of political district, there are actually very strict rules that the state sets that you need to follow. Um, in this case, um, for Precinct 14, the reason why it looks so odd is that it's actually following the school district line, uh, which is along the drain that's in the northern part of the township. So uh, where it might have seemed to make sense to just make it a nice straight line along I-94, the fact of the matter is we wanted to try to eliminate one of those split school uh, district precincts and follow the school mm -hmm. district line. So when things look strange to you or you hear people talk about during and doing these sorts of things, um, be advised that there's actually very strict uh, rules that you have to follow for a lot of those things and sometimes just because something looks odd uh, doesn't mean that there's anything that's wrong with it. So Precinct 14 experienced a boundary line change and we just talked about that but they do still vote at the same voting location at Great Oaks Elementary. Okay, so now that we're north of fi uh, 14 precincts, these are all new precincts. Precinct 15 is a brand new precinct. It has a new voting location, and that is at fire station number three. For those of you who have been in the township for a while, you know that we used to have a voting location at, at uh, fire station number three, um, and that was eliminated when we reduced precincts. We are now adding that back in to service precinct 15. The voters in this new precinct were previously part of uh, Precinct 14 and they previously voted at Great Oaks Elementary. They are now Precinct 15 voting at Fire Station Number 3. Precinct 16 is another brand new precinct. There's a new voting location for some. Some uh, previously voted at Higgins Elementary. This entire precinct will now be voting at Carpenord Elementary. Another new precinct is Precinct 17. 
there is a new voting location for some, uh, and that will be at the DPW building. Our next new precinct is Precinct 18. Precinct 18 has the same voting location. You just have a new precinct number. As Trustee Joseph pointed out, he used to be Precinct 9, and now he's the new Precinct 18. But that precinct does still vote at the Township Hall. Our last new precinct is Precinct 19. Precinct 19 is the southernmost, south, south Westernmost portion of the township that was uh, the part of Precinct 3 and that is now new, the new Precinct 19. It is a brand new precinct and a brand new voting location again at Faith Christian Center. For all of the precinct locations, uh, numbers, and addresses, you can find this information uh, in this format on our website under the Elections tab. And at this time, I'd like to open up to any questions for the board members and turn it back over to the chair. Any questions from the board members to the clerk? I think you did a very thorough job. Thank you. Thank you, board. Thank you. Thank you, Coordinator Gomez. Thank That's you. Fine. Thank you, Mary. <coughs> Excuse me. Item 5 is department reports. This is the moment or the time of the agenda when any departments can update the board of the public on any major items going on in the township. Assistant Director Johnson. Good evening, board. I just wanted to uh, update you guys, just let you know that uh, we are still ongoing with our connection fee study. We are still on target for the uh, March 1st um, date for they give us the final information regarding that project. We have been compiling data and have already had three meetings with HRC regarding this study. So I just wanted to update you, let you know it's still ongoing and that we are still on target to reach uh, the March 1st date. If anything changes, I'll be sure to let you guys know. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further departments, department reports? Any reports from the board? Yes. Trustee Joseph. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start, if I could, with a report. I guess I should get my microphone on. I'm not quite used to that. Um, if I could just update the board uh, with regard to our uh, cannabis committee. Um, last met on January 22nd, as the board is aware, and for members of the public, um, Clerk Barry and I chair that committee with uh, our public safety director, uh, Director Kirsten. And uh, at a, when I last uh, spoke, we were planning a, a full presentation to bring the board up to speed on the uh, work of the Cannabis Committee over the past year. Um, we went over in our last meeting, uh, just this past week, um, some finalized uh, ideas. And um, without getting into great detail, I would like to just point out that originally, I think the board uh, and maybe members of the public were under the impression that the Cannabis Committee would return to the board with a uh, sort of very binary recommendation. Either we do this or we do that. And uh, as we've tried to update you through the year, that really is an impossible scenario given all of the um, variances and, and um, different ways that different municipalities have gone. So we will focus our PowerPoint on bringing the board up to speed with just a historical view, uh, looking at a number of uh, changes that have occurred in the past year with regard to legislation, what some of the different licenses actually even mean and permits, who does what from a state level and from a local level. Um, and then we are gonna focus on three potential scenarios uh, one scenario will be uh, what we really are doing now, which is to opt out. We'll talk about some pros and cons associated with the opt out scenario. The other uh, scenario is what we see in some neighboring communities where it really just looks like a wide open uh, opportunity for vendors to apply for any and all licenses. And it's sort of uh, referred to in a lot of ways as the gold rush mentality. So everyone looking to strike it rich in the marijuana industry, um, you know, finding municipalities that are open to any and all licenses. And then the third scenario, which is the one we plan to spend the most amount of time on, is um, the, the potential of allowing um, a limited and very regulated uh, licensing uh, permitting 
That one is the most involved because it would really entail a lot of uh, coordination with our planning department. Our uh, planning uh, vendor, Giffels Webster, has had representatives uh, and we've been in constant communication with them. And so the presentation that we intend to make will include a scenario that give residents and board members an opportunity to see if there was consideration for approval of any permitting, where would it go, what would it look like, um, and in order to do that, you need to have some interactive relationship with the uh, zoning maps. Uh, this is, happens to be a specialty of the Giffels Webster team, and they'll be able to uh, show us if there was a, say, a grow uh, permit that was allowed, and we have um, uh, a number of setback requirements. So some of the uh, requirements are that our, our operation couldn't be within, say, a thousand feet of any park, school, senior center, daycare, a drug rehab facility, church, and so on. So as you start to X out different areas on the township map, where are these uh, licenses uh, permitted, if you will? And uh, it requires an extensive review by our planning team. They've indicated that they would need a little bit of time to put that uh, together for us, and so we are tentatively looking uh, and hopeful for the second board meeting in February to give the board a full presentation uh, on not only the work we've done, but also these scenarios that I've uh, laid out. Uh, again, we're hoping for February. Uh, we kind of think at this point it may be the first meeting in March. Uh, so that is an update on the Cannabis Committee. I'd also like uh, to share with the board, if you haven't received copies of it, I will make them available to you. But as the uh, liaison from the board uh, to the Planning Commission, the uh, Planning Commission was presented with the uh, annual report. The annual report is uh, statutorily required in that the Planning Commission must make a formal presentation to the board um, regarding the sort of year in review. Um, there have been a number of things that are worth note, uh, specifically the increase in um, sign applications, site plan reviews, uh, special land use request, rezonings, a uh, number of public hearings, and also some zoning updates regarding uh, several amendments to the uh, zoning ordinance this past year. Um, the uh, zoning updates are as follows. Uh, ordinance number 180 having to do with elderly housing and two family standards was a revised uh, uh, ordinance. Ordinance number 179 involving parking lot, landscaping, bollards, and outdoor display. Um, then ordinance number 177 dealing with wireless communication and uh, regulations with respect to wireless communication towers, um, which uh, in some way feeds into another area from planning that I'll touch on in just a minute. Planning Commission conducted 21 separate meetings in 2019, and uh, the, the plan for the year ahead is uh, quite comprehensive, as the board is well aware of the master plan. Um, is being prepared for what should have been a five-year review, but uh, will occur um, with a completed and comprehensive plan here in 2020. Uh, also, a, a planned comprehensive review and audit of uh, continuing to review zoning ordinances as well as sign ordinances. Uh, we have one that will be coming to the board um, in short order. In our last presentation, the sign ordinance is on its way to uh, Mr. Siebert's office for legal review. Uh, the work on the sign ordinance thus far has been done uh, by our uh, planning consultant. The other big issue is uh, clear zoning. Uh, clear zoning is a staple in the Giffels Webster uh, portfolio. Uh, without uh, getting into too great a detail, it allows uh, vendors, residents, anybody who accesses the township a website to go into a particular zone and you can see uh, what the property that you're interested in is zoned complete with permitted uses for that zone. It's of particular interest I would think to a number of the members in the audience today so I would encourage you just to explore take a look at your uh, property where you live and see what it's zoned for and then you could see where uh, what permitted uses are allowed in your zone. So if I could uh, sort of pre present to you the uh, 2019 Planning Commission Annual Report. It's a very brief synopsis, and I will make sure that everybody, if you don't already have it, will get a copy. Um, 
moving on to a very significant issue that arose from our planning commission meeting um, last week. I would like some feedback from the board uh, regarding an issue that we actually took up in July, uh, July 23rd to be exact. The issue involved a, um, a opportunity uh, was presented to the board uh, specifically involving a lease agreement uh, between the Charter Township of Chesterfield and the PI Tower Development LLC. The proposal which passed by the board uh, was in, in uh, the presentation portion an opportunity for the township to take advantage of uh, what could be a revenue enhancer and bring in revenue um, in a way that was um, fairly unique. Specifically, it involved the construction of a roughly 110-foot cell tower that would um, result in, I believe, and I don't have the exact numbers, but the contract that was drawn um, brought some $3,000 up front and then a monthly uh, rent or lease payment um, of $1,300. Uh, thereabouts, the numbers are entirely important, but at the time, I think the board looked at what was uh, potentially a good opportunity to raise revenue, and the contracts were drafted. Uh, Ms. Anderson, our, our uh, associate working with uh, Mr. Siebert, our township attorneys, uh, prepared a lease agreement uh, between the parties, and the lease agreement very clearly outlined that the lease was only a lease that uh, would go into effect upon successful uh, approval of the Planning Commission. That matter was brought before the Planning Commission last week, um, and our Planning Commission meeting was packed. Uh, it was packed with residents who were unaware of this cell tower and the concerns that the cell tower raised uh, for them, their property values, their safety, and a number of other things. The public hearing was uh, tabled, and I asked for the meeting to be, I asked for the issue to be tabled uh, because I really thought it was imperative that this board take a look at the decision we made on July 23rd. And uh, I, th I think uh, procedurally we got this one wrong. And what I mean by that is we, we looked for an opportunity and I think it was uh, done uh, with, with uh, good intentions, but the part that was missing was we all know that our board meetings typically contain one or two residents and not much public feedback. And when we put a cell tower in somebody's backyard, it makes sense that they're going to be concerned and they're going to come to a public meeting. Their first opportunity to learn of the public meeting came as a result of the Planning Commission sending notices to the surrounding neighbors because this particular tower is actually in a uh, residential zone. And so when you put a 110-foot tower literally on somebody's fence, uh, you have to send them notice. It's the law. And so what we got was for the first time a very crowded uh, audience who it very appropriately came up one after the other and expressed concerns on a, on a continuum of, of, of levels. Uh, and I think our, uh, our planning consultant did a nice job of explaining what the planning commission was allowed to consider. Specifically, there were a number of complaints and concerns about health impacts uh, with uh, frequencies and so forth. And those are very tightly controlled, as many of us know who have worked in this area. Um, the FCC and the governmental uh, federal level regulatory agencies that do all of the analysis, if you will, of safety concerns. And the long and short of it is, is no matter how many people come forward and say, I'm worried about cancer clusters or all of the things that I've read about uh, the dangers of cell towers, those cannot be considered on the planning commission level um, because the, um, the, the basically the rule is that the feds have already decided what is an acceptable uh, level of exposure, if you will. And so that is not an area that this board has the legal authority to consider. However, there are a number of areas that the board can consider uh, and the Planning Commission can consider, and I'm certainly willing to articulate those to the Planning Commission as to why we should uh, not construct this tower. But I thought from a procedural standpoint that it might be best to bring this back to the board for a review and to take a look at what we passed on July 23rd because we did it in absence 
of a uh, feedback from the people that we are trying to serve. So if we say to the residents, we're putting this tower there because it's good for the community, um, we raise revenue, we improve cell service and all of those kinds of things, that's a, that's a working theory. It was a good idea, but it lacked the review from the people who we represent. The people own that property. And if their property values go down, and then the taxes that we collect as a result uh, go down, what have we really done in terms of um, increasing revenue? And certainly the quality of life is another very, very strong argument. And as I say, there are several reasons which I will have no problem articulating to my fellow commissioners on the planning commission level, but the question for the board is whether or not that's an issue that needs to go to planning, or would the board consider a revisit of this issue? And I'd like to bring it when I have an opportunity to provide you with a more comprehensive packet. But I'd like to bring it uh, at the next board meeting uh, to, to sort of further articulate my concerns and um, ask that we reconsider that issue and um, strongly consider uh, walking away from this, uh, from this idea before sending it to the Planning Commission. Uh, so again, I'm not sure procedurally, we were in a, a bit of a tight spot with the holiday and our meeting was on Tuesday and getting this uh, to the board in a timely enough way to vote on tonight was really not possible. But I would like to uh, bring this to the board in two weeks with a very comprehensive sort of review on why I think it's a bad idea and withdraw it from consideration of the Planning Commission. So I don't know if I uh, spoke out of turn on anything, and I would ask Mr. Siebert to kind of fill in if I did say something that's uh, procedurally inaccurate or inappropriate, but uh, in terms of the timeline, is, is that a fair uh, timeline? Um, if you could, Attorney Siebert, comment on the situation that we're in and the, the reality that a special land use is a, solely a planning commission <clears throat> Um, an issue and that is a total separate entity. There's no influence from this board to that board. Um, in this instance, the special land use is on a township owned property. However, it could be on a non-township owned property right next door. And uh, I think Attorney Siever can fill in some of the blanks and maybe an actual agenda item you, and at, you, another, at another board meeting may help out a lot. Yeah, but you've, you've introduced an area that I would like to respond to if I could. The issue that I'm raising is not whether or not it's owned by a private or a public. It's owned by us. We sent it to the to the planning commission after approving it in July. I, I understand the issue. Okay. That, that's, that I understand the issue you're raising is maybe potentially um, going back on the board action of July 23rd. Reconsideration of the board action of the 23rd is really that, the only question. So that, uh, so that, that would be something for Director right. or for, um, Attorney Siebert, Mr. Siebert. Yeah, well, as, as the board knows, we do not attend planning commission meetings, so I was not at the last meeting. I'm familiar with the requirements of the cell towers, and as Trustee Joseph indicated, the concerns regarding uh, uh, the safety of the, of the cell tower has been preempted, which means it's been taken away from state regulation by the federal government. So the, the issues of whether or not you know, the, the decibel levels or whatever, whatever the, 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 the issues are regarding the safety of the cell tower has been taken out of our hands. There are, however, a number of other factors that the Planning Commission considers. But under our ordinance, a special land use is decided only by the Planning Commission. It does not come to the Township Board. If uh, I remember Chris Anderson in my office, after the Board directed her to, drafted the lease, it was negotiated, the Board approved the lease. If it's going to come back to this board, the question is going to be whether or not there's any wiggle room on the lease that's been executed to get out of it. And, you know, if it's been signed by both parties and it's subject to only planning commission approval and the board wants to reconsider it, we're going to have to look at that lease and see, and see whether or not, A, there's any room for the board to rescind the terms of the lease. And if so, what we need to do to do that, if the board is so inclined, and if there isn't, we have to evaluate what our legal position would be if we breach. I mean, remember, the board back in July said, we agreed to lease this piece of property to a private entity to build a cell tower, but it's going to be contingent on planning commission approval. They're now going through that process. If they're approved, they have the legal right to proceed with the construction. But if we want to 
take that out of the Planning Commission's hands, then we're going to have to undo the lease. If, I mean, if that's going to come back, we'll, we'll look at that and we'll find out what our, A, if there's a way out, and B, if there's not, what our legal exposure is if we breach. But it, it will not come back to this board for purposes of determining whether or not a special land use should be approved. That is 100% the Planning Commission's decision. If, if I could, maybe between now and the next board meeting, this probably will need to be a separate agenda item if you wish, Trustee Joseph. We, uh, I would urge you maybe to work, work out the details of what that's going to look like when it comes back as a our uh, liaison to the Planning Commission. I think that will fit right into your wheelhouse. Because in this invite, in this situation, um, there's no back and forth that we're, we can talk about it right now, and this is more for the public. Um, the public comment can only be at the end of the meeting and, or during an agenda item specific to that agenda item. And because there's not an agenda item on um, specifically relating to this tower lease, we were unable to discuss it until the end. No, I think uh, I think that's a good point. A uh, number of the residents that are here, I don't know them by face, but you know, I think the other board members have received emails regarding concern. And there are a number of people who just uh, don't understand procedurally what, what goes next and what goes, you know, how. I will bring the agenda item forward uh, at the next meeting. Um, if in the meantime, I'd like to get some feedback from the attorney with regard to um, whether or not because the contract was signed, it needs to be wholly decided by the Planning Commission. Uh, so, you know, again, if the language in the uh, contract, which that's not my area, but there was some language that talked about the construction of the pad, and uh, if, if the uh, no construction has been, been started, it would be my argument that we do have wiggle room to, we're not obligated to enter into a contract before it gets rolling. But that, I'll leave that to you, but I would like to have something from um, legal to give us an idea of the contract. Again, procedurally, I think we got it horribly wrong. We should always have a public hearing when we're contemplating a, a special land use that wholly changes somebody's quality of life first uh, before we enter into a contract. You know, I was part of the vote, so I'm not blaming anybody. We got it wrong. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, but we don't have anything in the air, and we have no construction that's begun, and we do have an opportunity to get it right. I'll figure out how to do that, but it sounds like the first step is to bring an agenda item back to the board for reconsideration of the vote on the July 23rd. Dave, I'll be prior to the next board meeting. I will look at the contract. I'll look at the Planning Commission file, obviously look at the ordinance, and I will put in writing what your legal options are well in advance of the next meeting so the entire board members have an opportunity to review it and ask any questions prior to the meeting. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further board yeah, um, updates? Well, I, I just have a question for uh, Mr. Joseph. Um, I did go to the Planning Commission meeting because I was contacted by some of the residents over the issue. And um, originally, when I looked at the uh, ordinance for the wireless communication towers, it's dated 1-20-1999. And I, there hasn't been an update to this ordinance that I know of. I, I, I checked and uh, went into the assessing department. Uh, the parcels in question are all R1B residential. Um, none of them fit that um, nomenclature for this uh, ordinance as it stands. Um, I'm, kind of wondering how the board went to signing um, a lease, and I'm probably as guilty as much for not reading more into the ordinance and getting into it, but uh, after I read the ordinance, um, it specifically uh, does not allow um, a cell tower in R1B residential. And the current setback that's on the, the drawing that I got from assessing where this is supposed to be um, violates the property line for the lots next to it. So um, I, I don't know how we got to a lease, but we're definitely not in conformance with an ordinance. And I don't know how we can not be in conformance with an ordinance and approve something without a variance. So uh, I think the Planning Commission needs to take that in consideration when they meet next, because uh, there's a lot of irregularities in here. Um, you know, in, including the fact that there was mention of the new cell tower supposedly collapses on itself. 
one of the gentlemen um, mentioned at the planning commission meeting that he was an engineer. Things don't always, uh, you know, work like they were designed. Uh, that, that's a proven fact. Uh, planes and helicopters were designed to defy gravity, and sometimes they fail. That's a fact. So uh, I think we need to step back and relook at this. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I may just... There are a number of issues, um, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to turn it into a debate necessarily tonight because we really do lack the proper sort of uh, procedural matter. You know, there needs to be an agenda item. There are really uh, just a, uh, trying to help residents who don't typically show up to these meetings understand what their government is doing was really why I raised it to the level that I've raised it today. There's a whole bunch of things associated with this that really do kind of stink. Uh, but I have faith that we can get it right, and it sounds to me like the right way is to simply bring it back. Um, I know people are here to express their uh, feelings on it. Um, the normal protocol is that a um, regular agenda item, we would debate, we'd have an issue, then we would take comments from the uh, any, anybody who wanted to speak on it. In this particular case, um, I would encourage anybody who was here to speak on it to use your time uh, at the end of the meeting during public comments to express it's not as though you can't be heard there's just not an agenda item to debate the things that treasurer lafada there will be a time for that i assure you uh both the contract the uh the way that it came and the outcome uh will be vigorously discussed tonight unfortunately is there's not a there's not a format for that but uh, there's no tower going up next week or next month and we will get this right uh, i'll work very hard to get it right and i think my board members uh, will assist me in that thank you i think you explained that uh what the process would be very well trustee joseph i did let a lot of leeway go um on this uh, this topic this is updates information on what's going on with meetings not necessarily a back and forth um there will be an agenda item on this uh, at a future meeting from the sounds of it if anyone does want to see um, the meeting that this was taken up on from a, a township standpoint it's on the township youtube channel and it's the july 23rd meeting and i think believe it's somewhere it was somewhere in the middle of, or the beginning of that meeting any further trustee or elected official updates well, one quick one for me and that is march 4th at six o'clock there will be a town hall in coordination with macomb county emergency management on the high water levels in this building that'll be march 4th of this year item six is the consent agenda and let the, the clerk read the item if you can please Item six is the consent agenda. All items under the consent agenda are considered routine by the board and will be enacted in one motion. There is no separate discussion of these items. If discussion of any item is required by a board member, it will be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Public comments on consent agenda items are permitted. Item A, approval of the minutes of the regular board meeting of January 14th, 2020. B, approval of the agenda with addendum if necessary, and we do have an addendum this evening. C, approval of the payment of bills as submitted by the finance department. And D, approval, approval request from public safety to pay invoices totaling $8,594.80 related to insurance mitigation. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve? Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion by Trustee Bosberg. Support. Support by trustee joseph clippery um mr supervisor i would like to ask the maker of the motion she'd be willing to amend to remove item 11a closed session from the agenda yes continued support motion by trustee bosberg support by trustee joseph to approve the consent agenda with the removal of the closed session discussion from the board comments from the public on the consent agenda Clerk, please call the roll. Trustee Vosberg. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Supervisor Ecovetti. Aye. Clerk Barry, aye. The consent agenda is adopted. Item 7 is the regular agenda 7A. Item 7A under the regular agenda is a recommendation to approve the allocation of funds from the 2020 Community Development Block Grant CDBG Public Service Funds. 
Do I have a motion to approve? So okay. moved. Motion by Trustee Anderson, supported by Trustee Vosberg. Discussion. This is just the public service funds portion of uh, the CBDG funds. There will be uh, another action item on this at the next meeting dealing with the bricks and mortar portion. Comments from the public. Motion by Trustee Anderson, supported by Trustee Vosberg to approve site item 7A as submitted. Clerk Barry, please call the roll. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Vosberg. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Treasurer LaFada. Aye. Supervisor Acovetti. Aye. Clerk Barry, aye. Motion passes. Item 7B. Item 7B is an approval to rec uh, approve a recommendation by Public Works to purchase a sandbagger model MB2 machine from Midwest Sandbags at a total cost of $5,550 from GL number 101446742. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Motion by Treasurer Lafada. Second. Supported by Cliff Berry. Director Coddington. Good evening. I'll, I'll just touch on this. Because of the high water levels, and uh, they are increasingly coming up, we are very concerned. Not only uh, not only the lakefront, but uh, any of the creeks and everything. Everything is still rising because uh, because the lake levels are coming up. We're going to be having more emergency managed meetings coming up soon. Uh, but we feel uh, this is the right thing to do to help us be able to manufacture sandbags faster and. Uh, Matter of fact, we want to get started on it if, if this goes if, the, if this gets approval. We'd like to get started on this and start stockpiling and sandbagging uh, pallets full of sandbags for the upcoming season. Questions for uh, Trustee Anderson? Yeah, so uh, you'd be uh, warehousing bags uh, for the public to come and pick them up. Would that be the focus of this? Yes, right now we, we don't have it carved in stone where we're going to do this, but we're going to probably start bagging at the DPW and they'll be able to pick the bags up at the DPW. That may change as time goes. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the logistics on everything. This, this machine is fairly transferable and uh, it, may be, it may work out better to take it to a location, get a bunch done, and then move on. We'll, we'll have to work through that. But for now, we're going to be bagging them at the DPW. Any further comments for direct, uh, Trustee Vosberg? Thank you. Um, I, su I support the concept of this. It, I'm looking at the uh, technology of how it works. It's so much faster than a shovel and a you know, bag like they had been doing. Um, I just would caution that we come up with some kind of process to distribute these because uh, while the purchase of this machine isn't very much money, the um, cost of the labor that might be involved, that more labor than what we had been doing providing in the past regarding the sandbagging. So nothing we have to solve tonight, but just caution that that doesn't become a budget overrun because yes. of the labor. Thank you. And we'll, we'll, we'll certainly consider that and, and try to work our way through that as, as we get this started. This hopefully, hopefully it does not turn into a, a labor uh, budget issue with, with our manpower. Trustee Joseph. Could we, could we see any issues potentially with uh, volunteer organizations uh, maybe after some training on the machine or uh, even just on the non-machine portion of like what the job entails of sandbagging to have, uh, you know, there are a number of civic groups, um, elected officials, you know, you name it, people come out. Um, could we see ourselves in a situation where we could use this machine in a way to uh, appeal to like uh, volunteer labor, uh, I, I I do believe that's very possible. Absolutely, it's it's a pretty simple machine to run, uh, pretty safe. Uh, you have to load it with the PC equipment, but other than that, uh, the, with the way the sand comes out in a bag, sure, even pulling the bags out and tying them and, and keeping the process going can save a, a ton of time. If perhaps in your presentation you can include some review by whatever the risk management portion of our township that would take a look at that and see what we could do to have some uh, hold harmless type waivers associated with that. And, um, you know, uh, you can get a lot of volunteers out for an afternoon, especially when, um, you know, Trustee Dominguez posted in the video of the tsunami coming over his property. There were a lot of people that came out in different civic organizations who just volunteered their time. And maybe uh, preparing that as an option when we purchased the machine 
of the labor should be the least of it, and we wouldn't have to dedicate, um, yeah, full-time staff to take away from theirs to really, you know, accommodate something that we could do in a volunteer way. Very good. Great idea. Thank you. There, there will be a whole lot more information on our efforts for 2020 high water at the, at the town hall. This is an important piece of the puzzle. Um, we cannot, as a government, um, perform work on private property. However, we can assist homeowners um, in any way possible um, to deal with this high water that's going to be coming. Last year, we provided approximately 35,000 sandbags, most of which were filled by uh, the public. And this year, I anticipate a similar type situation. However, this, um, this sandbagger automated um, machine is going to help assist that. Uh, we're also looking at pre-setting up resources for pumps and uh, hoses and for maybe vendors to be able to privately contract with private property owners to install sandbags or, or dikes or uh, any other kind of marine related infrastructure that will help them protect their property. I think this is a uh, piece of the puzzle that's missing and I do believe New Baltimore is looking at um, getting the exact same uh, unit for their community. And I believe Clay Township is also. So all three of us. Thank you. There'll be a whole lot more on the, on the March 4th board meeting and hopefully I'll be able to speak a little bit uh, more clear. Any further comments from the board? A uh, motion by Treasurer Fata, supported by Clerk Berry, to approve item 7B as submitted. Clerk Berry, please call the roll. Treasurer Lafata. Aye. Clerk Berry, aye. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee Vosberg. Aye. Supervisor Ekovetti. Aye. Item 7C. Thank you. Thank you, Director Coddington. Item 7C. Item 7C is to approve a request to renew and pay invoice. INV 2400440 in the amount of $18,483.35 to Diligent, formerly known as iCompass Technologies, for agenda management annual subscription from GL number 101265934. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve as stated. Motion by Clerk Barry. Support. Support by Trustee Vosberg. Discussion. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Just like to um, point out to the board members, this is our agenda management annual subscription. Um, we previously approved, or this board previously approved uh, this expenditure back in 2017. Um, for seventeen thousand four hundred and fifteen dollars, it has increased uh, in three years. It has increased uh, just a little over a thousand dollars due to the changes in the ownership, as well as the increased cost of technology, as well. Any comments from the board, uh, Trustee or Treasurer Lafada? Um, the uh, video management uh, HD package um, when I look that up on iCompass website um, that that package uh, is supposed to give us all the capabilities of uh, live streaming uh, putting the video up on uh, civic web and putting it up on YouTube um, it did mention that along with this comes a piece of hardware called an encoder um, are we getting an encoder with this package we do have one. Uh, we can get the updated encoder. Uh, when we went with our other, um, at the time, our other um, broadcasting system, it didn't, it wasn't compatible. We, we have it, um, but we can get the updated one to go with the new. Um, well, uh, it's, it would be, it'd be really Chris to have this package without having the encoder so we yes. can utilize it. Yes. So I don't know what it is, but I, I think we should, we should mm -hmm. add it, whatever it is. We will, yes. Any further comments? Motion by Clerk Barry, support by Trustee Fosberg to approve. A, oh, I'm sorry. We have a public comment. I had a question on that too. Uh, basically, it said on there that live streaming is available for that package. Is that the plan? Clerk Barry. Um, yes, if the board 
chooses to live stream, we have the capability to do that. I have not been directed by the board to begin live streaming. It's something that I contacted last week looking for the video from the December 17th meeting that was never entered into the log here. We couldn't see that. We wanted the meeting from two weeks ago. It was still not available. Uh, so the problem is that the query has to approve us before it's, you, can, you can view it. Uh, I don't know why that is. Why this thing, you know, if you're recording, basically you should be able to put it on the next day. But beyond that, the ideal is you should just keep the, keep the recording but at the same time live stream. Start bringing this board into the 21st century. And I request that you guys look at that. It's part of, you know, you would not make an amendment to do that. It's part of this motion to buy this Any further comments from the public or the board? Trustee Joseph. Uh, just to, to speak to the um, um, comment that was just made, in terms of the problems that we seem to have with getting our current board meetings online. Um, and I was uh, frantically searching to see if the July meeting that you referenced was even online. Most of the times the online videos have uh, really uh, big problems. Um, the last board meeting that um, Mr. Kadich referenced on the December 17th involved a lot of presentation from um, uh, presenters and there was no microphone. Uh, so the entirety of anybody who spoke at that podium throughout the night, you couldn't hear and then decisions are being made. So um, what, what do we have in the way of plans with this agenda item to address those? Because it really is, as he indicates, like we're, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. And it's years and years in the making. It's, it's, it's beyond ridiculous. And I had even contemplated tonight, I'll, I'll, I'll wait until these people are able to speak at the next one, just, just attaching a tripod somewhere and live streaming these on Facebook. The technology is available for anybody that has a Facebook app, and I can put it right in that corner and capture more than we're recording for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. It's quite silly. So does this agenda fix that? Because it's, it's time. Very, very. It doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because this technology has absolutely nothing to do with broadcasting. It has everything to do with agenda management, and management of the agenda items, how they're submitted, how they're <coughs> processed, and so forth. The broadcasting or the video component, we have the, the capability, This um, we have the software capability within this software, because that's what this is, we have it. The problem that we're having and why we've been so frustrated, first off, we do not have a media department here in the township, just for individuals who know that we do not have a media department. We don't even have an IT department. We have an IT vendor who uh, is not here in the township every day like a regular um, department. So uh, this item has nothing to do, this is just a software package that we use for management. So, but it has nothing to do with our broadcasting capabilities, all of the problems that we've been having. I've been so frustrated with them as well. I share the board's uh, members who've spoken on that as well. The technology that we had was all analog up until this year. We just went digital uh, a couple of uh, months ago or weeks ago. Um, and we've had problems with the digital upgrade as well. So um, this uh, software can accommodate any hardware that we have that works. The problem is we haven't had any software, we haven't had any hardware uh, that would work with it. First we had analog software, and then, uh, or excuse me, analog hardware, excuse me, that didn't work with any of the digital software. And now that we have digital equipment, uh, the problem is that the digital equipment is having issues as well. So we are clerks in the clerk's department. We can certainly handle the agenda, we can handle the minutes, we can handle putting it um, on YouTube, we can handle putting it, um, you know, posting it to our website and all that sort of thing. We can make sure that it's consistent with the minutes and that's why we review it, to make sure that the video is consistent with the minutes that we have. Um, but outside of that, when it comes to the, um, the broad, any kind of broadcasting capabilities, uh, that's far outside our scope. Um, we can do with what we have, but in, in terms of this particular um, agenda item, this um, product isn't for that, but the video component of it will allow for, it does provide the software um, to allow for us to do those things. We just need to get the rest of the pieces right. But that again is, is outside of our scope here in the clerk's office. Can, can I, so I want to see if 
and does the trustee owner say your trustee boss prove anything? Mm -hmm. Trustee uh, treasurer of the Vada. Um, I uh, spent some time the last couple days um, going on iCompass website and Google <laughs> what is audio video manager for iCompass. And basically, that software package that we're paying $5,380 some dollars for gives us the capability to, like I said, we can live stream, mm -hmm. we can copy it and put it up on Civic Web, we can send it to Channel 6. Mm -hmm. This is what the software package does. It requires the encoder to do it. Um, according to this literature that I read, you know, you can have a copy of it, but it actually says that the encoder takes the digital signal and has to take it back to analog and then transfer it. So maybe, maybe you should read this because it's, it's very, very descriptive of what the package is capable of and what it does. No, it doesn't broadcast. We have to send the media to a broadcasting station. Right now, we're capable of copying on a hard drive and a thumb drive, so it can be processed fairly easy. But we have the capability at this time to do that. It's a matter of the process flow. It needs to be copied onto a thumb drive, which is 180 gig. Or 128 gig. It needs to go to the clerk's office. The clerk's office needs to look at it and view it. it needs to pass it on so it can be put up on on our website. Uh, but we can copy it and live stream at the same time. Right now, if we have the encoder that should come with this pro package. Thank you. Any further comments from the board? Yeah, just a sorry, Trustee Anderson. Just a uh, follow up. The in terms of the recording, do these microphones have anything to do with that system? I don't know how many thousands we paid for this, but the last video, it looked like the camera was connected to the microphone. So if you watch the video, I could see everything uh, Trustee Vosberg was doing while Trustee Anderson was talking. So does this agenda item fix that, or what do we do with this uh, stuff? They're two entirely separate things. Um, this is this is all the broadcasting material, uh, all, all the broadcasting uh, and uh, hardware that the board approved. I think it was uh, several meetings ago. Um, so this this agenda item has nothing to do with that. Right. I, I could probably answer. Um, originally, when this was set up, it was the cameras were set to sense the person that was speaking. Since then, that has been disconnected, and it's controlled by our operator, Ms. Kemp, right now. So that issue will not happen anymore. Trustee Anderson. No, no comment. Any further comments from the board? Trustee Fosberg. Thank you. Um, I think we need to move on with this motion. Of all the comments brought up about being able to broadcast in a real-time fashion are legitimate things and we, we, that's something we should look at but I, I do think there there's disconnect here and to to be frustrated that one doesn't do the other doesn't get us anywhere so I, I would like us to move on with the vote and um, but also encourage um, supervisor's office to put together a group to um, well, well that, that group was put together okay there, there was a Qualification based selection team um, put together to uh, that, that came to this board with a recommendation for the system that we have, which is uh, relatively new. This is our third meeting. That that team was Clerk Barry, I believe, Trustee Anderson, and um, the Treasurer Lafada. So, yes, there's some upgrades that could be made, and I would like that team to get back together and figure out how to. Um, we are in the digital world to, to get us to that next level. It can all do that. Um, so, that, uh, so yes, that team should continue to um, get to the goal, which is to have our meetings uh, accessible as quick as possible. Um, we're working through some uh, some bumps, but that team is is together because they're the ones that recommended the system that we have. And as, as Treasurer Lafada pointed out, the system's smarter than um, um, than maybe what our capabilities are for. So, um, our meetings are are pretty. 
laxed. As you can see, there's multiple. We, we allow um, some back and forth speaking. This system is actually allowed where when you press your button, the video automatically goes to the one who's speaking, which, which caused the issues. Um, because this board likes to have the back and forth, and I do think it is a good way to run this meeting, um, that that service has been um, disconnected. So it's no longer chasing it like that. However, uh, working on some of the, the details, um, you know, you still gotta, you're still gonna get, get worked out. So good advice. I think it is time to move on. And I do believe that team should get back uh, Oh, I mean, and, and give us some more recommendations on how to improve even more than we have. And we, we have come a long ways, especially if you go back and look at where we were a couple of years ago to where we are now. Was that a motion to call the question, uh, uh, Trustee Vosberg? I'll turn it into that. Yes. Okay. Motion to call the question by Trustee Vosberg. Second. Supported by Clerk Perry. Clerk Perry, please call the roll on the motion to call the question. Trustee Vosberg. Aye. Clerk Barry, aye. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee uh, Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Supervisor Acovetti. Aye. Item 7C, there's a motion by Clerk Barry, support by Trustee Vosberg to approve. Mr. Supervisor, item. just technically we need to now vote on the motion. Yes, that's what I'm doing. Item 7C, motion by Clerk Barry, support by Trustee Vosberg <laughs> to approve item 7C as submitted. Clerk Barry, please call the roll. Clerk Barry, aye. Trustee Vosberg. Aye. Trustee no. Anderson. No. Trustee Joseph. No. Treasurer Lafada. No. Uh, Supervisor Accovetti. Aye. Item, what happened there? Uh, motion failed uh, on a tie vote. Okay, motion failed 3 3. Item 7D. Clerk, Barry, please read the item. Item 7D approval to execute the Michigan Uniform Video Service Local Franchise Renewal Agreement. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve as stated. Motion by Clerk Bailey. <clears throat> Support by Supervisor Ecovetti. Discussion from the board. Mr. Supervisor. Yes. Mr. Supervisor, I'd just like to make the board aware that this is uh, this uniform video service local franchise renewal agreement is an agreement that comes in front of all local municipal boards every approximately every 10 years. Uh, this uh, franchise agreement was approved uh, 10 years ago uh, by the board at the time. There is one portion of it that uh, this board needs to make a determination on, and that is you will see within the body of the um, document that the local board has to determine what the franchise percentage rate will be that the uh, franchise will pay the township in 2010 that was uh, five percent that is the maximum amount that is allowable so um, the board uh, when uh, there's an approval um, to execute the local renewal agreement uh, we do need to state what percentage um, the board is uh, approving the franchise agreement for I request the maker of the motion to approve item 7D with the same percentage rate as prior, which is 5% under fees. I will amend my motion to include 5% as the franchise uh, fee percentage. Continued support. Any further discussion from the board? Comments from the public? Motion by Clerk Barry, support by Supervisor Acovetti to approve item 7D as submitted with a rate of 5%. Clerk Barry, please call the roll. Clerk Barry, aye. Supervisor Acovetti. Aye. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Trustee Vosberg. Aye. Motion passes. Item 7E. Item 7E is a recommendation to approve Administrative Procedure Order APO 12-2020 Project Management Policy and Adopt Resolution 2020-01. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Motion, support. motion by Treasurer Lafada, support by Trustee Joseph. Discussion. Treasurer Lafada. Um, this is a project management policy. Uh, if you looked at uh, some of the earlier board meetings and looked at uh, voice, uh, there's uh, millions of dollars of uh, capital projects and capital improvements slated for the township in the coming years. Um, we don't have a very good process or procedure to manage those. Um, the 
project management uh, philosophy has been around for decades. You know, it's, a, it's a proven entity. Um, it uh, can be controlled with a Microsoft project uh, software package. And uh, what it does um, is it's, they give, us, give the residents the project deliverables based on cost, quality, and timing. Um, it's going to make it transparent. Uh, the information will always be available, and it will manage all of the risks that would be uh, probable in a, in a project. So when you manage the risk you'll, and you list the risk, you'll know if there's something physical or financial that we need to keep an eye on moving forward so that we always get a quality project and we don't spend any more money than we need to. Um, like I said, this has been around the private sector for a long time. We have nothing in the township. Uh, I don't see any reason why this wouldn't be a good fit. Uh, I went through this with our uh, HR director, and he was in concurrence that this would be a good fit for the township. Thank you. Any further comments from the board? Trustee Joseph. Uh, I think Trustee Anderson got missed out on the last loop, so if I could just defer to him. Nothing. Sorry, Mr. Supervisor. Uh, the question, is, question was for uh, Treasurer Lafada as the maker of the motion. I know we um, talked a lot about um, project management, and I think um, um, this is sort of in your uh, wheelhouse. Um, I know I've tried to understand uh, when you start talking about uh, whatever the Six Sigma project management and, um, you know, the black belt and all that. Uh, is this consistent with what uh, the business world utilizes in terms of project management? Yes, it is. It's exactly textbook almost of what's done normally in the private sector. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Bosper. Thank you. Um, who is responsible for making sure each project follows this procedure? Well, every project gets a project manager assigned to it. That project manager will be the one responsible. They should be responsible to the executive in, in charge for being uh, in line with all the project requirements. But every project requires a project manager be assigned. And that person would... That person's Follow up with this, make sure right. that. All right, thank you. Any further trustee Anderson? Oh, I, I noticed that. It looks like <laughs> I, I, keep, I, keep, I keep missing that a little. Um, I'll bring it up to the podium. Uh, I read this. I think Treasurer Lafada did a great job. Uh, Treasurer Lafada did a great job. There's a microphone. Again, being the project manager that's been, just been discussed, this thing involves timing. Uh, if there's a lot of items involved and come to the end, it, it can give you a way to make sure that they're ordered on time so they all come together as the project's moving forward. Uh, most projects, at least when I worked at Ford, basically you had to maybe once a week send out a notice saying, where were you? We used red, green, and yellow. Green, you were fine. Yellow, you're in trouble. Red, you're really in trouble. And this gave the people above you that you're responsible to deliver this to a heads up as to what they have to do to get involved to make the manager make the project move forward. I think it's a great thing. I think you could really use it here. It's time you used it here. Thank you. Thank you. I also do support this item wholeheartedly, codifying uh, this process into an APO. Uh, just makes good sense. Motion by Treasurer Lafada, support by Trustee Joseph to approve item 7E as submitted. Clerk Barry, please call the roll. Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee Anderson. Aye. Trustee Vosberg. Aye. Supervisor Ecovetti. Aye. Clerk Barry, aye. Motion passes. There is an addendum, item 8A. Clerk Barry, if you would. <laughs> Item 8A is the addendum. Approve a request by Public Works for an emergency repair of a sanitary sewer lift station pump by Kennedy Industries at a total cost of $18,450 from GL number 591-541-933. Support. I'll make a motion to approve. approve. Support by Treasurer Lafada. And Director Coddington is here to discuss this emergency 
repair if any members have a qu any questions. First of all, I want to apologize to the clerk's office um, for forgetting to get this on the agenda in a prompt manner. So thank you for, for getting it on. It was definitely my fault. I'm not going to make excuses. I just got back from vacation and this was on my desk. But um, to go to go back to the station, this is our this is our biggest um, sewer lift station, uh, and they are the biggest pumps, and it pumps the most uh, sewer that we have in the township. So uh, we did. I did send it to Treasurer Lafada and talked with the supervisor about this when I got back, and uh, we we got started right away on fixing it. So. But I do apologize. This should have been back to the clerk's office way before uh, it was on this, and, and we'll make sure that happens in the future. Any questions for Director Coddington, Tre Treasurer Lafada? Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that uh, this was an emergency, and we know that pumps need to be fixed. And uh, thank yeah. you for coming to the board meeting and, and enlightening the board. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I will tell you, this this number pump, we're calling it number four for, for this uh, We'll call it pump number four. This is its first major rebuild. Uh, it is a lot of money, but these pumps are well more than twice that much to fix them. You can, you can absolutely rebuild them at least one time uh, for for about uh, less than half the price of replacing it. But yeah, this is about a forty to fifty thousand dollar pump, so uh, it, it is important and it moves a lot of fluid. So thanks again. Any further questions for Director Coddington? or from the public. Motion by Supervisor Agabetti, supported by Treasurer Lafada to approve item 8A as submitted. Clerk Barry, please call the roll. Supervisor Agabetti. Aye. Treasurer Lafada. Aye. Trustee Anderson. Um, Trustee Joseph. Aye. Trustee Bosberg. Aye. Clerk Barry, aye. The motion passes, thank you. Thank you. Item 9 is public comment. Please state your name and address for the record and limit your comments to five minutes. My name is Tom Howick. I'm a resident of Chesterfield Township. Um, uh, I wanted to speak briefly about the uh, issue that um, was brought up concerning the cell tower. Uh, I heard all that was said. I understand that the decision doesn't uh, rest here, but there's a little bit of information I'd like to pass along. Um, I was here at the Planning Commission meeting. Uh, I heard about it that day, so I didn't have a, a, a enough information to make my point, and I think uh, the point I was trying to make was, uh, was not clear. So I'm going to speak to uh, this as a liability issue for the uh, township. Um, I don't know if anybody here is aware of the term, the legal term, bodily integrity. I, I, I'll explain a little bit what the issue is. I'm going to read this to you. Um, bodily integrity is the inviolability of the physical body and the emphasis, and it emphasizes the importance of personal autonomy and self-determination of human beings over their own bodies. In the field of human rights, violation of bodily integrity of another person is regarded as an unethical infringement, intrusive and possibly criminal. Everyone has the right to autonomy and self-determination over their own body. And the only person with the right to make decisions about one's body is oneself, no one else. This is the principle of bodily integrity, which upholds everyone's right to be free from acts against their body which they did not consent to. The U.S. Supreme Court has consistently, since the 1800s, held that bodily integrity is a protected right under the 14th Amendment of the, US, of the uh, United States Constitution. Practices that violate a person's bodily integrity can range from piercing a baby girl's ears, to being exposed to toxic chemicals without one's knowledge, to forms of violence such as rape or medical treatment administered against a patient's wishes. Why does this matter? The World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer classified RF, EMF, radiofrequency electromagnetic fields as class B human carcinogens. This, to, this in 2011 based on credible evidence that linked long-term wireless exposure to brain cancer. 
More recently, a 10-year, $30 million study conducted by the National Toxicology Program of the United States National Institute of Health. This is a very credible organization. Sought to determine if exposure to wireless radiation from cell phones increased the risk of cancer. The conclusion by a 13-member independent panel of experts in 2018 was that there was clear evidence of an increased cancer risk in the highest, with the highest level of scientific certainty. This is the uh, National Institute of Health. Dr. Ronald Melnick, principal designer of the study, stated, quote, we should no longer assume that any current or future wireless technology, including 5G, is safe without adequate testing. So what? So there's a, a legal concept called precautionary principle. It states that when an activity raises, raises threats of harm to human health or to the environment, precautionary measures should be taken even if cause and effect relationships are not fully established scientifically. I have here an article from the U.S. Um, News and World Report. Last, uh, at the last meeting, I made a comment about the Flint water crisis, and it was uh, misunderstood as a, as a um, concern about health effects. And what I really was getting at was the, 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 the um, Flint lawsuit, and why is it so important? It's not so much a, a, that it's so important because of the health um, aspects of it. What's important about it is it's a civil rights lawsuit. Approximately 30 seconds left. Okay. The justices, this, the, the Supreme Court or upheld a lower co court um, um, ruling that rejected immunity for the officials of the city of Flint. The case centers on the Constitution's 14th Amendment guaranteed due process under the law which can protect people from government-induced harm to their personal security, their health, and it's a legal principle known as bodily integrity. The defendants argued that the court gave dangerous, the court have dangerously expanded the rights, applying it to policies and decisions that resulted in public exposure okay. to environmental toxins. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further public comment? Mark Strakowski, a Chesterfield Township resident. Sorry about that. Um, I know Tom ran out of time. Uh, I guess I'd just like to finish that thought. I, I believe what, what Tom was driving at is that that lawsuit, um, as he stated, isn't because people were drinking. Um, I mean, obviously, that was the ultimate reason. But the lawsuit isn't about the water and people being harmed. The lawsuit was more about their civil rights about it being preventable and about the um, uh, Flint uh, officials actually uh, being uh, taken to court um, and not being um, exempt due to, um, and I apologize, this isn't my document, but um, they're not immune. The city officials were not immune uh, based on this. So I think that's um, the final thought that maybe Tom just didn't have time to, to finish saying. Okay, so. Um, what I would like to say on top of that, first of all, I want to thank the Township Board for hearing me out. Second, I want to thank you for your service to Chesterfield Township. It's probably a thankless job at times, and um, as you guys mentioned, not a lot of people show up, but uh, obviously on something like this, we care, so we're showing up. And uh, <clears throat> I want to take this opportunity to say that I do appreciate how the city reacted to the, I'll call it a water crisis or the, uh, the flooding. I uh, really appreciate that. It was, it was helpful. Uh, I know I had to go up to the DPW a few times, so thank you very much for uh, for looking out for us there. Um, I sent each one of you uh, on the board an email, so I'm not going to reiterate that and, and uh, go through all the statistics uh, that I had stated there, uh, but I do have a couple comments. Uh, you saw, um, you see currently a lot of residents here that, that, that oppose the cell tower. There were a lot earlier. Um, they, they left just because it wasn't on the agenda, knowing that it will be coming up on the agenda. Uh, that's fine, but you can see how many people stay behind because we want to have our voices heard, and I'm sure we'll be back on, I think the 11th was the date stated. So just, just know that, uh, to, just know where we stand. A um, couple other uh, points. 
I understand what I said earlier that health risks can't be taken into account during the planning commission, but as a voter and as these voters and as a resident, we do want you to take into account health risks. And um, I also heard earlier that maybe it's in the planning commission's hands at this point, but I'm looking to you as the board to please reconsider, do what you can. I know um, uh, Mr. Siebert, I hope I'm saying that correctly, is gonna look into what we can do about the lease. If there's anything we can do there, um, yeah, I, I would look to this board, and, and we're all, as, as voters and residents, going to be looking to this board uh, to help us out and to stand by us so we can stand by you on Election Day. Okay, so um, you know, that's another point I wanted to make. And then um, someone else brought this up, but it's, you know, it's true. There's, if we reduce the property values in that area, how much are we actually getting? $1,300 a month, um, you know, that's about 15000 a year. I, I, I'm willing to bet to, if we do the math, um, as a matter of fact, I was sitting back there doing the math, there's studies out there that say 20% of, uh, I'm sorry, homes can reduce up to 20% in the area of a cell tower. If you do the math on that, with our current SEV of whatever is $32, $33 uh, per 1,000 SEV, that's 20 homes losing 20% of their value. Um, excuse me, yeah, that's true. Uh, it's 40 homes losing 10% of their value. That's a pretty densely populated area in homes, and I'd venture to say that, that we, um, you, you know, you, Basically, yes, you will make money by leasing that property out, but you're going to lose it on the, uh, on the taxes. Now, I, for one, would be one of the first people here asking for my taxes to be reassessed if that tower goes up. So um, I, I won't bore you with the rest because it was in my email, but I wanted to thank you for your time and uh, let you know that, um, that, uh, that we'll be back here on the 11th. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Any further public comments? Hello, board. My name is George Delamarez. I am president of the Harbor Drive Homeowners Association. Uh, we um, represent 88 property owners that own a combined 162 um, properties, taxpaying properties, located uh, directly across from the uh, fire station. Uh, we have written a letter uh, to uh, the board and the planning commission um, stating some of the reasons and including research supporting why we strongly suppose the, uh, oppose the proposed tower. I, I will summarize some of the reasons. First, I'd like to thank Mr. Joseph and Mr. Alfada for making my life a lot easier. You covered uh, quite a bit of the information I was going to cover. Uh, but first, decreased property value. I, you know, nobody can argue that our property values will plummet uh, with this hideous visual scar. Uh, two, danger. Collapse is possible even with the newly engineered self-collapsible towers. News reports of, uh, of collapsed tower incidents uh, were included in our letter. Our lakeside area often experiences ice, high winds, we even had a tornado once. We also found and included an act that went into effect in 2012, allowing the height of towers like this to be increased by 20 feet with no public process. That would grow this tower to 130 feet, making things even worse. Third thing is zoning. We understand a lease design and then a, a zoning variance was okayed, making this possible to, uh, to allow for the cell phone tower. Uh, this was done with very or little no communication with the property owners, uh, which is us, the taxpayers. This area is residential. A fire station or family homes, not a cell tower, is what we need. Uh, fourth, we don't need uh, we don't need cell coverage. Uh, I've got a letter here from a from a resident that couldn't be here today. He said the speed test app can show the exceptional service we already get in our neighborhood. Neighborhood attaches a picture of the data rates I get on cell service with my phone. These are broadband data rates on cell service from the interior of my house. Another reason we don't need a tower in our neighborhood. The quality of the signal and service is exceptional already. These data rates are more than sufficient to support 4K streaming, even at peak usage 
4 and 6 p.m. What's, and then on due diligence, he questioned again, what signal surveys have been done that shows a tower is needed? What other options have been investigated to prove service in our area? To improve service in our area, is there data from the analysis on these alternatives? Has the township had an independent party assess? Commercial sites away from our homes make a lot more sense. Uh, Mark was mentioning the math that he was doing in his head. I kind of did as a business owner. I did some math myself. I thought there was two lots, but there's actually three lots there. Uh, with two lots, I, uh, I'm, I'm no pro at this. I figured $350,000 uh, for that property, 15000 a year, equates to, and I think, I think that's too conservative. I think that, that property is worth more. 15000 a year equates to less than 4% return on our investment with reliability and um, and even the, po even the, even the possible um, litigation. About 30 seconds. Yeah, she's getting even the possible time. litigation that we will be forced uh, as homeowners to, 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 to make to correct the depreciated um, home values. Thank you for your time and thank you for what you do. Thank you for coming. Any further public comment? This is this is public comment. You can speak about anything, anything at all. My name is Bob Pottinger. My wife and I were married in 1973. My introduction to Chesterfield was sandbagging and more sandbagging. Most of you were too young probably to remember that. A few of you, anyway. The Corps of Engineers told us the water would rise, as they do today. Every swimming person was sandbagging. Myself, Selfridge, uh, Army, Navy, Marines, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, anybody that could fill a sandbag was building up. Couldn't build up the lake because you see what's happening now. We got, we got splash blocks that divert the water back. That doesn't do anything. It breaks 10 foot on shore, the water lands. Well, they had an idea back then. The Corps put up steel cribbing, probably about this high and probably about this wide. Two by two by tens, two by twelves would would fill this cribbing on both sides. They'd come out and put sand sand in the middle and then cover that with plastic. That worked just fine. The people that were trying to break their neck doing that put their effort on the canal. The waves aren't going to break on the canal. So between between that effort from the core and the, the people's effort sandbagging the canals, it, it worked just fine. The water went down, we were able to dis, dis, uh, disconnect the cribbing and the, and the boards and um, it worked out real well. I don't know what their plan is now, but I think today the water's higher than it was back in the 73. Uh, if any of you have clout with the Corps or with those people, this would be the time to ask them. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments from the public? <clears throat> My name is Dan Blackburn. I live at 48280 Mallard. I've been there 35 years. Unfortunately, I don't have any notes. Uh, I was in the middle of making some to bring to this meeting, so it sounded like I knew what I was talking about. But my son, who was the manager of a restaurant up in, in uh, Mount Clemens, got called away because one of his cooks didn't show up, and he's 
got to do everything. So he had to go to work. His wife, who is a radiologist, she couldn't be at the house. So I went over there because Tyler, who's two and a half, and Jesse, who's one and a half, are the most important things in my life. And that damn tower that's being supposedly going to be put up endangers their life. It endangers my life, my wife's lives, my son, and those two little boys. The other day, or last week, the only people that were in favor of that tower were people that were going to make money off it. Now, tonight, I'm hearing that some kind of deal was struck, and suddenly, oh, we can't get out of it. Well, you can get out of any deal that's on paper. Everybody knows that. Look at Obama. He couldn't, he couldn't bring in the aliens because it was against the law, but he did it anyway because nobody stopped him. And now look at Trump. He's just as bad. He wants uh, any criticism of Israel to be anti-Semitic, and that's attacking our Constitution, our First Amendment rights, and it just seems like when somebody gets elected, they forget that they got elected because they're the worst of two, or the least worst of two evils. And that's what we're getting anymore. People get in these seats, and I don't mean any one individual, but people get in these seats and suddenly, I know better than you do. Look at Hackle, he wants to bring in more uh, aliens from somewhere. We don't need any more aliens and we don't need any more cell towers. I get good cell phone, I get good computer access, and I'm perfectly happy with it. And I want you to get out of this deal one way or another, and I know that it can be done if the will is there of, with these board members. So, like I said, had no notes. I know it sounds really unorganized. It kind of comes from shooting from the hip, but that's the way I do it sometimes. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blackburn. Any further public comment? I'd like to speak to the board about the uh, cell tower situation. Oh, I'm sorry, your name for I'm that. sorry, Don Huff. I'm a, I'm a resident on Harbor Drive. And uh, I guess the point I'd like to make is that I thought that the function of our local government was to protect, protect the rights of the citizens. And I think one of those rights is the free um, uh, the right to enjoy the property without any inhibit, anything to inhibit that. And I think the cell phone tower is going to be a big detriment to the area. It's non-conforming, um, and it, as was brought up, it doesn't fit the zoning for the area. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Um, I'm sure you'll do the right thing. Thank you, Mr. Huff. Any further public comment? I had another subject I was going to talk on, but I'd like to say I wish the first gentleman I talked had been here when I was trying to get the township and the supervisor from spraying Roundup on the fag ladies. I think he had a good argument that would apply to everything. Uh, beyond that, um, one of the reasons uh, I'm up here today is a while back there was a letter to The Voice in which I presume Hackle had basically gone after the two senators from my state stating that we would accept the Selfridge, they'd like to have the F-35s. Uh, we know there's a problem with them, and I don't think I'm against them, but I think taking all of that responsibility and giving it to Hackle when we've got nothing to gain by giving those F-35s here and not saying anything back about maybe those conditions that we'd like to see them, you know, started here, see what happens, see what the noise level is like, see what kind of pollution I got. But I didn't see anything come back from the supervisor disputing the fact that there may be a problem here and, again, protecting the citizens that are going to be in a flight path. Now, we all know that those things are basically operating at better than 80 decibels, which you need uh, earmuffs uh, for. Uh, I'd like to see a basically another town hall issued and have all the residents, particularly the ones that are going to be in the flight path, 
Watch those things take off. The wheels up there over Chesterfield. Commercial, residential, shopping for the next six miles. The speed of sound is about 760 miles an hour. So as they're going, you're going to have all of that time for those high decibels. And it's taking off and landing. Now, I would hope somebody in this township would come up and say, we should really think about this, whether we're going to support it or what it's going to take for us to, to support it. There's two towns, one in Vermont, that I understand the Air Force ended up buying 200 and some homes in the flight path because of the noise level. The ones in the Wisconsin are disputing, and that's the ones that you had the two senators say, we'll take those without any problem. Now, I think we should at least say in advance to the Department of Defense and to Selfridge that, look, yeah, go after them, bring them here, but give us a fair shot, see what they're like, and see if we can tolerate them. Or did you support a town hall meeting to get everybody together that's going to be affected by this and come back to them with an answer? Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments from the public? Let's bring up the board, Trustee Joseph. like to put my microphone on. Um, I'd like to come back to the cell tower if I could. A um, couple of other issues that I wanted to uh, discuss. One, the um, last week you may have seen, I uh, got a number of calls and I think the board is aware of the uh, Fox 2 News uh, Hall of Shame and the presentation, uh, all the expose that was done regarding a, uh, a property developer, builder, who was well known to the township. For those of you that didn't see the broadcast, um, the builder developer was the principal uh, owner of, uh, I believe it's either Sunset or Sunrise Homes in Shelby Township. Uh, that individual was in front of the planning uh, commission and this board about three years ago with a plan to turn the Salt River Golf Course uh, into a, a development. Uh, many, many homes, it would have uh, changed the landscape of the Salt River uh, property and the neighbors were very, very concerned um, about possible flooding. I was concerned because this individual had a very, very close relationship with our previous supervisor. It really didn't look like a very nice deal, uh, just putting it diplomatically. And I was dead set against the proposal for a number of reasons. Um, I was really uh, impressed with the crowd that came out. It looks a lot like the crowd that's here tonight, but those were the Salt River Flats neighbors. And I walked that neighborhood uh, for weeks and stayed in touch with many of them because that project, had it gone forward, would have dramatically changed their lives. And uh, I was, after hearing their stories and their concerns, was not going to let that go. And uh, if you've watched any of the meetings or come to the, any of the meetings, you'll know that for a better part of an hour, uh, this individual's legal team took shots at me personally with threats of lawsuits and uh, that I was ginning up the crowd and all of these kinds of things. And I said to that individual, who's a very powerful attorney, uh, I was about as worried as the, about those lawsuits as a cloudy day. What I was doing was right. Uh, I didn't feel very good about what was going on there and the, um, the courtesies and the uh, things that were extended to this team of builders uh, and the familiarity they had with some of the uh, staff, uh, vendors that you pay for that were township employed really troubled me. Um, it's troubling further that some of those individuals and relationships are still in place today and that builder shows up again three years after that project with a uh, whole host of uh, customers who got the short end of the stick who are stuck with construction loans and liens on their property because of what is alleged to be very shoddy uh, and corrupt business practices. Now again, um, that, that's not my issues in so much as uh, as I went back and reviewed 
after watching the story to follow up with public records that are available to you online. It was very interesting to me that throughout this broadcast, the builder was talking about how he intended to make all of this long line of customers whole. He was coming into some money, and Rob Wolchek, the, uh, the Hall of Shame uh, reporter, made a comment to the effect of, what are you planning to win the lotto? And uh, he said, I can't get into the details, but I have this great property that I'm going to be uh, you know, and, and I'll make them whole within a few days. So we'll be watching the story to see if he does. But it dawned on me, I wonder if that property he's talking about is that property over on 23 Mile Road. And sure enough, I come into the township and I review the, the uh, tax search records which are available to you, and the title of that property has now been changed. And he owns the golf course. And so I go, well, what are you going to do with the golf course now? And then I hear about a new project we have in the township for the township to purchase the golf course. And that, to me, is emblematic of all of the problems that we've had in this township with transparency and uh, open dealings. And I've been real quiet tonight as it relates to your issue or the issue that brought a number of you here today. But I'm very, very, very troubled by what seems to be some leaders in this township who seem to be walking around uh, with township money like uh, Jack and the Beanstalk. And we keep buying magic beans and negotiate these transactions in quiet uh, what, what are now, we can't call them backdoor deals, they're called uh, synergy meetings. So when a leader in New Haven would like us to put out fires for, for New Haven, we have private meetings and contracts that are negotiated, and then it comes to light, and then everybody scurries. We have a pipe that comes into the township with, with holes in it, and the liability is $1.7 million, and we embrace that without any review of the board, we got more magic beans. Guy comes in, sells us a golf course, and he's on TV talking about how he's gonna make it right by selling land, and we're the chumps. And these don't come to the board. Uh, Trustee Anderson asked me, same question that I was asked when I was on the planning commission, who brought this deal? Who, who's the point of contact for if you're a guy that builds cell phone towers, who do you talk to about getting a tower put in next to somebody's backyard? Who do you talk to? Because I didn't quite understand all of Mr. Blackburn's point, but he did raise an issue that said if there's a will, the contract is not going to be executed. And of the contract, why would we sign a contract knowing that it's not valid until the planning commission does its work? So we can't have an active contract really because there's another step, which is why I'm trying diplomatically to bring this really stinky mess, and it is a mess. And uh, I won't shy away from it, I'm part of it. If you go back and watch that meeting on July 23rd, you'll see uh, there was a couple of other issues on that, board, on that board meeting that night, one of which was the Weber Paddle Park, and um, there was a lot of discussion. I hope you can see the video and uh, pay attention, but it's like a constant uh, watchdog exercise, and I missed one on July 23rd, and I'm sorry, because we never should have approved that contract or even the thought of that contract. Uh, and it, it took me a while to kind of put the pieces together. Uh, during the planning commission, a guy got up and he said, you know, this planning commission changed an ordinance, and the ordinance required setbacks. And the setback said that you couldn't build anything, you couldn't build a tower within 100 feet of a building, and you couldn't put a building within 100 feet of a tower. Did you change that because there was some uh, plan to put a tower on township property? And I told that individual no, because when, the, when that ordinance, as a part of the planning commission, when that ordinance came, it was presented to me in a very altruistic way that this was a audit of our existing ordinance and that this was good practice. But I think the guy was 100% right. There are, there are movements that are afoot here 
and they uh, really are just about managing outcomes. I'm a part-time trustee, and I'm not trying to shirk my responsibility. I'll do better, uh, and I'll do right by you on this one as well. Uh, as it relates to the, to the concerns that were raised at the podium, uh, Mr. Hawk is exactly right. There are concerns, and I understood him at the Planning Commission meeting regarding uh, human rights and this concept of bodily integrity. I think, unfortunately, I won't be able to get fully behind those because it's the one that will be the most easily defeated, in my opinion. And I'm not an attorney, but I do absolutely love, uh, well, without the politics, I've been watching the impeachment, and I'm one of those weird guys. I love, the pol I love politics, and I love the law, and I love to hear the arguments that go back and forth, independent of which party you belong to. There's some brilliant minds, and they're putting forth some very interesting things. And it's, if you listen, you can learn things about our Constitution, and then you hear a challenge. And so I really appreciated the presentation that, that he made. And uh, the first thing that I thought of as he was talking was Mr. Kadich and his concerns about uh, toxic chemicals being sprayed. And sure enough, he got up and talked about it. But I will remind all of those arguing the um, exposure to magnetic fields and class B human carcinogens, that a lot of things are considered poison, but poison, as we know, is really determined by the dose. And the argument that you will uh, inevitably run into is that the dose or the levels have been deemed safe by those all-knowing bureaucrats in a faraway land. Uh, I don't know that that's the argument that you will have the most success with, but again, I'm not an attorney. We have a great attorney, and I will rely on him. Um, it's, it's the same reason I wouldn't take out my own appendix. You might enjoy it, but you can get into real trouble if you try to act as a lawyer. I'll go to the guy that I trust. Uh, Mr. Seabird and his team are phenomenal, and uh, we'll, we'll evaluate it that way. Um, the health risks have, have come about in the emails in a number of ways. Um, Property value is an interesting one that uh, warrants being looked at. The, um, the right to, to, to be protected and the expectation that your government should protect you is very valid and worthwhile. Um, again, procedurally, there are, there are ways to do this. And uh, for those of you that emailed me today, I agreed. I'd, I'd be happy to stay after talk with any one of you about specifically how you go about that. And I'm happy to email anybody who leaves me contact information what I think would be the best, uh, most productive way for you moving forward to get your message heard. Uh, it rests in the uh, zoning ordinance. And if the matter goes before the Planning Commission for a review, there are a number of legal reasons that the Planning Commission can reject the uh, proposed special land use. I would encourage you to take a look at those and uh, get a little organized as you come to the podium and talk about your concerns. An effective strategy is really, um, and the number of people that show up, make no mistake, a lot of things happen here which would never happen if there are bodies in those seats. And uh, I, I am very encouraged, the more people that come, the better it gets. Uh, speaking of making sure that the things that happen here are seen in the light of day, makes no sense to me that we still can't get uh, a broadcast. Uh, we have the most recent meeting is a December 17th meeting that is um, no good. You can't hear most of the speakers that speak from the podium. And so uh, I talked about it before. I'll just bring a tripod and I'll set up my phone and I'll Facebook Live every meeting uh, and I'm not going to expend any more, vote to expend any more resources towards electronic equipment until we enhance the transparency in our township. It's a very simple fix, and uh, I'm not sure why. Um, when Trustee Vosberg mentioned that uh, maybe we should put a QBS team together, it was rapidly responded to where we did put a QBS team together, and the fruits of their labor are what's on display here. Uh, I think these video broadcasts are certainly as important as the energy that went into acquiring a new trash can division within the township. And I think that uh, purchasing trash cans and storing them uh, is, is uh, probably a little bit lower on the list than getting our meetings out to people. They can't come 
every two weeks and watch this nonsense. We have lives, and I respect that. But when you want to tune in to see where your government is spending your money, it should be easy. And you should be able to mark it on the video to go to the point that matches the agenda item that you're interested in. We don't do any of that. Um, but again, if I or any other trustee starts talking about how we do that with existing personnel, we receive an email uh, reminding us who's the boss, the supervisor. The supervisor has powers enumerated to him in the statute. The, the, the uh, township uh, uh, rules, if you will, that dictate what the supervisor does, what the clerk does, what the treasurer does. And the day-to-day -day operations are managed by the township supervisor. Everybody here answers to him. The buck stops with the supervisor. So uh, last, I will tell you that I have a theory and a, and a proposal to change that as well. I am proposing and will present to the board in very short order uh, the concept of a township manager. A township manager who will answer to all seven board members and allow the role of the supervisor to be that of um, the, the, the visionary, the visionary sort of role of a supervisor to go out and look at all these things, these great things that are going to happen. But the day-to-day -day operation, who does the day-to-day -day management of the township is lacking. It's lacking horribly, and I don't think it's the fault of the supervisor as an individual. I think our structure of government is such now that it does require somebody who is here to answer questions. Last week, we had all kinds of problems in the township, and I've talked for way too long. But as uh, water is flooding in businesses and uh, the violations so high that you can't even imagine the danger associated with uh, events that are occurring in the township, um, our township supervisor who handles day-to-day -day operations is skiing, not available. We need somebody here to deal with the day-to-day -day operations of the township. That, that can be resolved with the township manager. So a lot of things to digest. When we resolve your cell phone tower issue, please don't forget about what you see here and the concerns that hopefully are in your mind now and talk to your neighbors and get people at these meetings because I can tell you, the more empty seats, the more nonsense you get. It's just a fact. And at the end of the day, we get the government we deserve. You have to hold people accountable. If they don't think you're watching, a lot of really ugly and really ugly things happen. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Anderson. I did let a, I, I did let I, I did let a, a little leeway go, but as we get closer to an election season, we're going to want to do everything possible to not campaign from the rostrum. No, Trustee most Anderson, grateful for your generosity, Trustee Supervisor. Anderson. Like that commentary that was well well spoken on Mr. Supervisor. I don't know why why you even had to bring that up, but you've been doing it off and on for the last three years, and I know you're kind of fighting something right now, so I don't want to waste a lot of your energy responding to us. When this tower issue came up on the July 23rd uh, meeting, it seemed kind of innocuous. Uh, more the thing's going to collapse on itself. These questions were brought up. And uh, I have said before, normally when there's an agenda item, there's usually four votes to pass that item on most cases. I went along with the rest of the board and voted in favor of that. We have a whole different vision of what's going on. It affects your neighborhood. And I am looking forward to a redo on this whole issue of this tower over there. And Mr. Joseph, you brought up a tremendous points, uh, Mr. Lafada. And... Um, I know February 11th, hopefully, we can resolve this favorably. Uh, we do work for you, and um, that's my campaign speech. We work for the people who put us here. You know, if you don't like it, replace us. You know, if we're doing okay, okay, we won't lose sleep either way, but it's your choice. That's my campaign speech for tonight. I would hope, I would hope that you would keep an eye, and how these meetings uh, get kind of long, they kind of noisy here. I would hope you keep an eye on what's happening with your government, with with your tax dollars that you pay. I could cite several other things tonight, but you know, I'm going to save that uh, for my comments. Let's get closer to uh, uh, what, what when's the primary here, uh, Madam Clerk? Uh, and uh, November. Um, 
it seems like a lot of what goes on here operates in a vacuum. The local paper is more interested in uh, which it is and uh, uh, dipping in the ice water. Uh, chili cook-offs, unless it's a letter to the editor or something like that, op-ed page, which we there's some great ones. You don't hear what's going on here. Trying to hunt it down on uh, YouTube or Facebook, that, that becomes problematic too. But I would hope that after we resolve this, you do stay involved in what's going on with your government. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee, Trustee Vosberg. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Um, regarding the issues of um, the cell tower, I'm looking forward to the information we get from our attorney because we, we need to get that, we need those answers. Um, there's more I would like to say, but that would sound more like a campaign speech, so I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Treasurer Lafayette. Um, I'd like to thank the residents uh, that came out tonight to voice um, their opinion and their needs uh, on the cell tower issue. Um, I'm one of the ones that have always listened to the voice of the customer, and the residents are, are my customers, so I'd like to thank you for coming out. Um, I will be consistent with Mr. Joseph and try and resolve this. Um, I, I know Mr. Joseph's uh, frustrated about um, the uh, microphone issue and the live streaming. Um, there is a QBS team. Um, I'm one of the members, and uh, I started working on a process flow. It's a, it's a simple issue. As soon as the process flow is completed, it's a matter of the copy goes to the clerk, the clerk transfers it to another person in the township, the township puts it up on Civic Web and sends it to Channel 6 and puts it up for broadcasting. Not that difficult. The other thing I will do is I'll make sure that I put on the agenda for the next meeting a agenda item to have a discussion and improve having live streaming for the township uh, board meeting minute or board, board meetings. Um, the, the other thing, uh, you know, there's, there's a there's a lot of issues in the township. Um, hopefully, um, project um, management uh, APO will help. What it should do is it should bring a lot of things to be more transparent to the residents of what's being done in the township and how your money's being spent. So hopefully that, that'll be uh, something that's gonna be positive moving forward. Um, there are some things that we do in haste. Um, we, we purchase property. We don't need uh, contracts. We, uh, we don't understand what the risks are and we move forward anyway. And I, I think that leaves us a little short-sighted at times and I think we need to step back and look at everything we do, every contract we sign, and make sure that we're protected and there's no way that we're gonna get caught with something that's gonna cost the township more money than it should. Thank you. Thank you, Cook. Clerk Barry. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Welcome to campaign season. Welcome to that's, that's That's all of us. That's all of us, right? Um, and I was making comments to the clerk. Welcome to campaign season. Welcome to election season. Thank you, board, for listening to the presentation that Mary Gomez and I gave tonight on elections. Um, it is election season. We are full swing into it. We are processing applications. We are processing ballots. We received ballots last week. Um, those will be coming out to those who requested an absentee ballot. Um, in this coming, we hope to have those out by the first week in February. If you do not receive an absentee ballot that you have requested uh, by the first week, of, excuse me, the end of the first week of February, please call the clerk's office and we will check and see what's happened. Sometimes if you don't sign an application, if there's an issue with an application, a uh, uh, ballot will not be uh, issued to you. So if you are expecting your absentee ballot and did not receive it uh, by the end of the first week of February, please call the clerk's office and we will look into that for you and resolve the situation. Also, uh, with the item that was rejected, uh, that failed this evening, um, just to, to make the, some clarifications and to make some corrections as well, um, is a multi-mode um, 
functionality uh, uh, product. It is not just agenda management. It is, what, it is the backbone of what the clerk's department uses to process agendas for the regular township board, the cannabis committee, the special, uh, special township board. Um, we, uh, it also maintains the planning commission, zoning board of appeals, beautification, parks and rec, economic development, historical society, election commission, board of review, and the water and sewer rate advisory board. It manages those meetings in terms of making them available to the public and its scheduling as well. It manages all the agendas and minutes. Um, it does all of those things. What did we do prior to having this? Prior to having this, we were kind of in the Stone Age. We used Microsoft Word. We used email. Um, and then we, uh, it had no interconnectivity as far as links went. Um, the, the live streaming, we would not have access to anymore. So if we vote to live stream, we need to now put a product in place to allow for that because that's what the subscription allowed for. Um, we will maintain this as long as we can. If anyone wants to see what iCompass does, go to the township website, click on the button on the main page that says agendas and minutes. All of that functionality and all of that support, um, I don't know how long we're going to have it now. We will maintain it as long as we can, um, but that entire page, that entire, uh, all of those functions will be gone. Uh, that is what iCompass was. And so um, the board was very wise that three years ago when they brought us out of the Stone Age and into the modern age with this particular application. Um, we will continue to maintain it as long as we can. When they do stop our subscription, we will have to go back to the old way of doing it. Uh, I apologize for that, but that is exactly the, the ramifications of what, what that product meant to this township and what it meant to the access to the public um, to all those things. Everyone wants transparency, but then we remove tools that allow for that. So uh, we will do everything that we can um, to maintain it as long as we can. Um, and then you will you'll probably see a considerable amount of changes to that. And I apologize for any inconvenience that that causes in advance. Please know that um, that was not our intent. I think it was the issue was that that particular product was confused with all of the broadcasting and recording of meetings equipment. That's all of the hardware here and the competing software that or applications that we had with that function. Um, the only interaction that iCompass has with that is that it would link certain agenda items to a video that was provided by the equipment that we had. So um, as Trustee Joseph mentioned, we didn't have that. We, we did, and we do, and you can find that um, on our website as well. If you want to just see the video on public comments, you could go to that, or just on a specific agenda item, you could go to that clip in the video. But it's just like anyone in IT knows garbage in, garbage out. So if we put a garbage video feed in to iCompass, that's all it has to work with. So um, the problem is on the other end. This board approved over $50,000 in upgrades to our broadcasting equipment. I was on that QBS team, I am on it. And I'd like to also bring to the attention that I was adamantly opposed to it. I spoke, up and I spoke in opposition to it in the QBS team. I was adamant with my fellow members that the solution wouldn't work. It wouldn't work with what we currently had in place. It wouldn't work for the way that we conducted meetings. I knew after seven years it was not the answer, and I said that. And then I said it again at publicly at the board meeting, and I voted no on it. I was the only member who voted no. And I voted no because I knew it would, was not the answer. It was not the solution that Chesterfield needed. And now we're seeing the ramifications of that. So um, it doesn't surprise me that we're having ongoing problems. But on the other hand, um, I tried very hard. And in fact, I was chastised quite considerably at that meeting that I shouldn't be speaking in opposition to the QBS team. I should just go along and with the team and say, yes, because I was a member of that team and the team wanted it, and the team recommended it, that my voice of opposition shouldn't be known. And I know that there's plenty of members on our board who aren't afraid to be the lone no vote, who aren't afraid to be the one to say, I'm going to do the right thing, regardless of what other opinions are. And in that case, that was me. And so um, I hope that we will eventually, and I trust that we will eventually solve that problem. We will solve the problem of our broadcasting issues. We will solve the problems of our, of our hardware issues and so forth. Um, and the clerk's department will do everything we can to continue to maintain the level of service that we've been providing for the last three years using iCompass. But once that subscription <laughs> runs out, 
we will have to go back to the way we were doing it before. And again, I apologize if you're not able to access a lot of the services that you have gotten used to over the last three years with regards to meeting management and agendas and getting minutes and things like that. Um, we strove to improve transparency. The board voted unanimously to implement that solution. It was working really, really well. Uh, we uh, heard nothing but compliments on it. Um, we no longer will have that. So we maintain as long as we can, but I can't guarantee how long that will be. You will still be able to access agendas and minutes, but now it will be in, in uh, the way we used to do it before, and that is downloading the Word document or having us email it to or whatever the case might be. Um, but we will simply uh, do our best to provide the highest quality of service we can to you, um, even given those limitations. So I'd like to thank Mr. Supervisor if my comments are complete. Thank you. I'd like, like to thank the residents showing up. Um, this is a hard enough job at local level because the decisions we make, <clears throat> they, they're, they're a lot more personal than at the state level or at the federal level. And land use issues, um, seem to hit home more than anything else. What what I don't appreciate up here, and you, you, you see some of the some of the disconnect, is uh, elected leaders and officials who know better to use half information, misinformation, in in outright uh, lies, time and time again on topics that. Um, you know are more complicated, especially when it comes to land use issues. I urge you to watch the meeting on July 23rd and see where, where, this, where, this, top, where this idea came from, who supported it, where it's at. Now to fix it, that's what, that, that, that's what this is all about. Now it doesn't mean you're not gonna have a cell tower four doors away. There's. There, there's, there's land right, there's, there's, there's complicated issues when it comes to developing property and, and personal property rights. So all of, all of those things come in, into play. Some, so many comments made by Trustee Joseph, and not only at this meeting, but at just about every meeting for the last two years, um, none, of, none of those comments even deserve a, a response because of how ridiculous they are. And do I believe that the Salt River Golf Course should be preserved as an open space in the recreational area? The answer is yes. Been out there on that for a long time. Just brought one um, at the last meeting at the end of Hooker in Salt River to purchase. Very divided on this board. We did um, uh, a, able to secure that piece with a grant. It's a high impact piece. Again, uh, members of this board um, don't, don't agree with me on that. So yes, I'm out there saying at Salt River Golf Course, we should preserve as much of that as possible. We've got development pressures all around us, and we don't have much Salt River frontage left. So I don't know what the, all, all the, the misinformation and the, the, the outright lies, frankly, um, that were said by Trustee Joseph, but the only thing I actually agreed about that he said was that I think you talked too long. Our next meeting is February 11th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion by Cliff Barry, support by Trustee Vosper to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed by saying nay. We are adjourned at 7 or 9.37 p.m.